Dramatis Personae of Cymbeline by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cymbeline by William Shakespeare. Dramatis Personae. Cymbeline, King of Britain. Read by Bruce Peary. Queen, Wife to Cymbeline. Read by Ariel Lipshaw. Clotin, son to the queen by a former husband. Read by M. B. Imogen, daughter to Cymbeline by a former queen. Read by Elizabeth Clatt. Posthumus Leonatus, a gentleman, husband to Imogen. Read by David Goldfarb. Bellarius, a banished lord, disguised under the name of Morgan. Read by Algy Pug. Guderius, son to Cymbeline disguised under the name of Polytot, supposed son to Morgan, read by Dennis Sayers. Or Viragas, son to Cymbeline, disguised under the name of Cadua, supposed son to Morgan, read by O123. Bizanio, servant to Posthumus, read by Matthew Rees. Cornelius, a physician, read by Amy Graymore. First Lord, read by Rick F., First Lady, read by Rashada. Second Lord, read by Ariel Lipshaw. First Gentleman, read by Algy Pug. Second Gentleman, a gentleman of Cymbeline's court, read by John Fricker. Lady, read by Rashada. Lord, read by Rick F. First British Captain, read by Elizabeth Clett. Second British Captain, read by John Fricker. First Jailer, read by Bill Mosley. Second Jailer, read by Ariel Lipshaw. Attendant, read by Bill Mosley. Messenger, read by Elizabeth Clatt. Filario, a friend to Bostomus. An Italian, read by Raken. Iacimo, friend to Filario, an Italian, read by John Fricker. Frenchman, read by Timothy Ferguson. Caius Lucius, General of the Roman Forces, read by Mark F. Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. First Senator, read by Algy Pug. Second Senator, read by John Fricker. First Tribune, read by Bill Mosley. Roman Captain, read by Bill Mosley. Soothsayer, read by Timothy Ferguson. Jupiter, read by Elizabeth Clett. Cecilius Leonatus, read by Jason Bortles. Mother, an apparition, read by Robin in Norman, Oklahoma. First Brother, an apparition, read by John Fricker. Second Brother, read by Ariel Lipshaw. Narration, read by David Lawrence. End of Dramatis Personae. Act I of Cymbeline by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cymbeline by William Shakespeare. Act I. Scene one, Britain, the garden of Cymbeline's palace. Enter two gentlemen. You do not meet a man, but frowns. Our bloods no more obey the heavens than our courtiers still seem, as does the king. But what's the matter? His daughter and the heirs of his kingdom, whom he proposed to his wife's sole son, a widow that late he married, hath referred herself unto a poor but worthy gentleman. She's wedded. Her husband banished, she imprisoned, all is outward sorrow, though I think the king be touched at very heart. None but the king. He that hath lost her too, so is the queen, that most desired the match. But not a courtier, although they wear their faces to the bent of the king's looks, hath a heart that is not glad at the thing they scowl at. And why so? 
he that hath missed the princess is the thing too bad for bad report and he that hath her i mean that married her alack good man and therefore banished is a creature such as to seek through the regions of the earth for one his like there would be something failing in him that should compare i do not think so fair an outward and such stuff within endows a man but he you speak him far i do extend him sir within himself crush him together rather than unfold his measure duly what's his name and birth i cannot delve him to the root his father was called cecilius who did join his honour against the romans with cassibelan but had his titles by tenantius whom he served with glory and admired success so gained the sur edition leonatus and had besides this gentleman in question two other sons who in the wars of the time died with their swords in hand for which their father then old and fond of issue took such sorrow that he quit being and his gentle lady big of this gentleman our theme deceased as he was born the king he takes the babe to his protection calls him posthumus leonatus breeds him and makes him of his bedchamber puts to him all the learnings that his time could make him the receiver of which he took as we do air fast as twas ministered and in spring became a harvest lived in court which rare it is to do most praised most loved a sample to the youngest to the more mature a glass that feated them and to the graver a child that guided dotards to his mistress for whom he now is banished her own price proclaims how she esteemed him and his virtue by her election may be truly read what kind of man he is i honour him even out of your report but pray you tell me is she sole child to the king his only child he had two sons if this be worth your hearing mark it the eldest of them at three years old in the swathing clothes the other from their nursery was stolen and to this hour no guess in knowledge which way they went how long is this ago some twenty years that a king's children should be so conveyed so slackly guarded and the search so slow that could not trace them howsoever tis strange or that the negligence may well be laughed at yet is it true sir i do well believe you we must forbear here comes the gentleman the queen and princess exeunt enter the queen posthumus leonatus and imogen no be assured you shall not find me daughter after the slander of most stepmothers evil-eyed unto you you're my prisoner but your jailer shall deliver you the keys that lock up your restraint. For you, Posthumus, so soon as I can win the offended king I will be known your advocate. Mary, yet the fire of rage is in him, and t'were good you leaned unto his sentence with what patience your wisdom may inform you. Please, your highness, I will from hence to-day. You know the peril. I'll fetch a turn about the garden, pitying the pangs of barred affections, though the king hath charged you should not speak together. Exit. O oh, dissembling courtesy! How fine this tyrant can tickle where she wounds! My dearest husband, I something fear my father's wrath, but nothing always reserved my holy duty what his rage can do on me. You must be gone, and I shall here abide the hourly shot of angry eyes, not comforted to live, but that there is this jewel in the world that I may see again. My queen, my mistress, O oh, lady, weep no more, lest I give cause to be suspected of more tenderness than doth become a man. I will remain the loyalest husband that did e'er plight troth. My residence in Rome at one Filario's, who to my father was a friend, to me known but by letter, Thither right, my queen, and with mine eyes I'll drink the words you send, though ink be made of gall. Re-enter queen. Be brief, I pray you. If the king come, I shall incur I know not how much of his displeasure. Aside. Yet I'll move him to walk this way. I never do him wrong, but he does buy my injuries to be friends, pays dear for my offences. Exit. 
Should we be taking leave as long a term as yet we have to live, the loathness to depart would grow. Adieu. Nay, stay a little. Were you but riding forth to air yourself, such parting were too petty. Look here, love. This diamond was my mother's. Take it, heart. But keep it till you woo another wife, when Imogen is dead. How? How? Another? You gentle gods, give me but this I have, and sear up my embracements from a next with bonds of death. Putting on the ring. Remain. Remain thou here while sense can keep it on, and sweetest, fairest, as I my poor self did exchange for you to your so infinite loss, so in our trifles I still win of you. For my sake wear this. It is a manacle of love. I'll place it upon this fairest prisoner. Putting a bracelet upon her arm. Oh, the gods! When shall we see again? Enter Cymbeline and lords. Alack, the king! Thou basest thing, avoid! Hence from my sight, if after this command thou fraught the court with thy unworthiness, thou diest. Away, thou art poison to my blood. The gods protect you, and bless the good remainders of the court. I am gone. Exit. There cannot be a pinch in death more sharp than this is. O oh, disloyal thing, that shouldst repair my youth, thou heap'st a year's age on me. I beseech you, sir, harm not yourself with your vexation. I am senseless of your wrath. A touch more rare subdues all pangs, all fears. Past grace, obedience. Past hope, and in despair. That way past grace. That mightst have had the sole son of my queen. Oh, blessed that I might not! I chose an eagle, and did avoid a puttock. Thou took'st a beggar, wouldst have made my throne a seat for baseness. No, I rather added a lustre to it. O oh, thou vile one! Sir, it is your fault that I have loved Posthumus. You bred him as my playfellow, and he is a man worth any woman, overbuys me almost the sum he pays. What art thou mad? Almost, sir, heaven restore me. Would I were a neat herd's daughter, and my Leonatus our neighbor's shepherd's son. Thou foolish thing. Re-enter queen. They were again together. You have done not after our command. Away with her, and pen her up. Beseech your patience. Peace, dear lady daughter, peace. Sweet sovereign, leave us to ourselves, and make yourself some comfort out of your best advice. Nay, let her languish a drop of blood a day, and being aged, die of this folly. Exeunt Cymbeline and Lords. Fie, you must give way. Enter Pisanio. Here is your servant. How now, sir, what news? My lord, your son, drew on my master. Ah, no harm, I trust, is done. There might have been, but that my master rather played than fought, and had no help of anger. They were parted by gentlemen at hand. I am very glad, aunt. Your son's my father's friend. He takes his part. To draw upon an exile! Oh, brave sir! I would they were in Afric both together, myself by with a needle that I might prick the goer back. Why came you from your master? On his command. He would not suffer me to bring him to the haven. Left these notes of what commands I should be subject to, when it pleased you to employ me. This hath been your faithful servant. I dare lay mine honour he will remain so. I humbly thank your highness. Pray, walk a while. About some half-hour hence I pray you speak with me. You shall at least go see my lord aboard, for this time leave me. Exeunt. Scene two, the same, a public place. Enter Cloten and two lords. Sir, I would advise you to shift a shirt. The violence of action hath made you reek as a sacrifice. Where air comes out, air comes in. There's none abroad so wholesome as that you vent. Ah, oh, 
if my shirt were bloody then to shift it have i hurt him aside no faith not so much as his patience hurt him his body's a passable carcass if he be not hurt it is a thoroughfare for steel if it be not hurt aside his steel was in debt it went o'er the backside the town the villain would not stand me aside no but he fled forward still toward your face stand you you have land enough of your own but he added to your having gave you some ground aside as many inches as you have oceans puppies i would they had not come between us aside so would i till you had measured how long a fool you were upon the ground and that she should love this fellow and refuse me aside if it be a sin to make a true election she is damned sir as i told you always her beauty and her brain go not together she's a good sign but i have seen small reflection of her wit aside she shines not upon fools lest the reflection should hurt her come i'll to my chamber would there had been some hurt done aside i wish not so unless it had been the fall of an ass which is no great hurt you'll go with us i'll attend your lordship nay come let's go together well my lord exeunt scene three a room in cymbeline's palace enter imogen and pisanio i would thou grewest unto the shores of the haven and questionst every sail if he should write and not have it twere a paper lost as offered mercy is what was the last that he spake to thee it was his queen his queen then waved his handkerchief and kissed it madam oh senseless linen happier therein than i and that was all no madam for so long as he could make me with this eye or ear distinguish him from others he did keep the deck with glove or hat or handkerchief still waving as the fits and stirs of his mind could best express how slow his soul sailed on how swift his ship thou shouldst have made him as little as a crow or less ere left to after eye him madam so i did i would have broke mine eye-strings cracked them but to look upon him till the diminution of space had pointed him sharp as my needle nay followed him till he had melted from the smallness of a gnat to air and then have turned mine eye and wept but good pisanio when shall we hear from him be assured madam with his next vantage i did not take my leave of him but had most pretty things to say ere i could tell him how i would think on him at certain hours such thoughts and such or i could make him swear the she's of italy should not betray mine interest and his honour or have charged him at the sixth hour of morn at noon at midnight to encounter me with orisons for then i am in heaven for him or else i could give him that parting kiss which i had set betwixt two charming words comes in my father and like the tyrannous breathing of the north shakes all our buds from growing enter a lady the queen madame desires your highness's company those things i bid you do get them dispatched i will attend the queen madam i shall exeunt scene four rome Filario's house enter Filario, iachimo a frenchman a dutchman and a spaniard believe it sir i have seen him in britain he was then of a crescent note expected to prove so worthy as since he hath been allowed the name of but i could then have looked on him without the help of admiration though the catalogue of his endowments had been tabled by his side and i to peruse him by items you speak of him when he was less furnished as am now his was that which makes him boss was out and was in i have seen him in france we had very many there could behold the sun with as firm eyes as he the matter of marrying his king's daughter wherein he must be weighed rather by her value than his own words him i doubt not a great deal from the matter and then his banishment 
Aye, and the approbation of those that weep this lamentable divorce under her colours are wonderfully to extend him. Be it but to fortify her judgment, which else an easy battery might lay flat, for taking a beggar without less quality. But how comes it he is to sojourn with you? How creeps acquaintance? His father and I were soldiers together, to whom I have been often bound, for no less than my life. Uh, here comes a Briton. Let him be so entertained amongst you as suits, with gentlemen of your knowing to a stranger of his quality. Enter Posthumus Leonatus. I beseech you all, be better known to the gentleman whom I commend to you as a noble friend of mine. How worthy he is, I will leave to appear hereafter, rather than story him in his own hearing. Sir, we have known together in Orleans. Since when I have been debtor to you for courtesies, which I will be ever to pay, and yet pay still. Sir, you are right, my poor kindness. I was glad I did atone my countrymen and you. It had been a pity you should have been put together, with so mortal a purpose, as then each bore, upon importance of so slight and trivial a nature. By your pardon, sir, I was then a young traveller, rather shunned to go even with what I heard, than in my every action to be guided by others' experiences. But upon my mended judgment, if I offend not to say it is mended, my quarrel was not altogether slight. Faith, yes, to be put to the arbitrament of swords, and such too that would by all likelihood have confounded one the other, or have fallen both. Can we, with manners, ask what was the difference? Safely, I think, t'was a contention in public which may, without contradiction, suffer the report. It was much like an argument that fell out last night, where each of us fell in praise of our country mistresses, this gentleman, at that time vouching, and upon warrant of bloody affirmation, his to be more fair, virtuous, wise, chaste, constant qualified, and less attemptable than any the rarest of our ladies in France. That lady is not now living, or this gentleman's opinion by this worn out. She holds her virtue still, and I my mind. You must not so prefer her four hours of Italy. Being so far provoked as I was in France, I would abate her nothing, though I profess myself her adorer, not her friend. As fair and as good, a kind of hand-in-hand -hand comparison, had been something too fair and too good for any lady in Britain. If she went before others, I have seen, as that diamond of yours outlust as many I have beheld, I could not but believe she excelled many. But I have not seen the most precious diamond that is, nor you the lady. I praised her as I rated her. So do I my stone. What do you esteem it at? More than the world enjoys. Either your unparagoned mistress is dead, or she's outprized by a trifle. You are mistaken. The one may be sold or given, if there were wealth enough for the purchase, or merit for the gift. The other is not a thing for sale, and only the gift of the gods. Which the gods have given you? which, by their graces, I will keep. You may wear her in title yours, but, you know, strange foul light upon neighbouring ponds. Your ring may be stolen, too, so your brace of unprizable estimations. The one is but frail and the other casual. A cunning thief, or a that-way accomplished courtier, would hazard the winning both of first and last. Your Italy contains none so accomplished a courtier to convince the honour of my mistress, if, in the holding or loss of that, you term her frail. I do nothing doubt you have store of thieves. Notwithstanding, I fear not my ring. Let's leave here, gentlemen. Sir, with all my heart. This worthy signor, I thank him, makes no stranger of me. We are familiar at first. With five times so much conversation I should get ground of your fair mistress, make her go back, even to the yielding, had I admittance and opportunity to friend. <laughs> no, no. I dare thereupon pawn the moiety of my estate to your ring, which in my opinion overvalues it something, but I make my wager rather against your confidence than her reputation, and to bar your offence herein too, I durst attempt it against any lady in the world. 
you are a great deal abused in too bold a persuasion and i doubt not you sustain what you're worthy of by your attempt what's that a repulse though your attempt as you call it deserve more a punishment too gentlemen enough of this came in too suddenly let it die as it was born and i pray you be better acquainted would i had put my estate and my neighbours on the approbation of what i have spoke what lady would you choose to assail yours whom in constancy you think stands so safe i will lay you ten thousand ducats to your ring that commend me to the court where your lady is with no more advantage than the opportunity of a second conference and i will bring from thence that honour of hers which you imagine so reserved i will wage against your gold gold to it my ring i hold dear as my finger tis part of it you are afraid and therein the wiser if you buy lady's flesh at a million a dram you cannot preserve it from tainting but i see you have some religion in you that you fear this is but a custom in your tongue you bear a graver purpose i hope i am the master of my speeches and would undergo what's spoken i swear will you i shall but lend my diamond till your return let there be covenants drawn between sir my mistress exceeds in goodness the hugeness of your unworthy thinking i dare you to this match here's my ring i will have it no lay by the gods it is one if i bring you no sufficient testimony that i have enjoyed the dearest bodily part of your mistress my ten thousand ducats are yours so is your diamond too if i come off and leave her in such honour as you have trust in she your jewel this your jewel and my gold are yours provided i have your commendation for my more free entertainment i embrace these conditions let us have articles betwixt us only thus far you shall answer if you make your voyage upon her and give me directly to understand you have prevailed i am no further your enemy she is not worth our debate if she remain unseduced you not making it appear otherwise for your ill opinion and the assault you have made to her chastity you shall answer me with your sword your hand a covenant we will have these things set down by lawful counsel and straight away for britain lest the bargain should catch cold and starve i will fetch my gold and have our two wages recorded agreed exit posthumus leonatus and iachimo will this hold think you signor iachimo will not from it bray let us follow him exeunt scene five britain a room in cymbeline's palace enter queen ladies and cornelius whilst yet the jews on ground gather those flowers make haste who has the note of them i madame dispatch exeunt ladies now master doctor have you brought those drugs pleaseth your highness i here they are madam presenting a small box but i beseech your grace without offence my conscience bids me ask wherefore you have commanded of me those most poisonous compounds which are the movers of a languishing death but those slow deadly i wonder doctor thou asks me such a question have i not been thy pupil long hast thou not learned me how to make perfumes distill preserve yea so that our great king himself doth woo me oft for my confections having thus far proceeded unless thou think'st me devilish is't not meet that i did amplify my judgment in other conclusions i will try the forces of these thy compounds on such creatures as we count not worth the hanging but none human to try the vigour of them and apply allayments to their act and by them gather their several virtues and effects your highness shall from this practice but make hard your heart besides the seeing these effects will be both noisome and infectious o oh, content thee enter pisanio aside here comes a flattering rascal upon him will i first work he's for his master an enemy to my son how now pisanio doctor your service for this time is ended take your own way 
Aside. I do suspect you, madam, but you shall do no harm. To Pisanio. Hark thee, a word. Aside. I do not like her. She doth think she has strange lingering poisons. I do know her spirit, and will not trust one of her malice with the drug of such damned nature. Though she has will stupefy and dull the sense a while, which first, perchance, shall prove on cats and dogs, then afterward up higher. But there is no danger in what show of death it makes, more than the locking up the spirits at time, to be more fresh, reviving. She is fooled with a most false effect. And I the truer, so to be false with her. No further service, doctor, until I send for thee. I humbly take my leave. Exit. Weeps she still, sayst thou. Dost thou think in time she will not quench, and let instructions enter where folly now possesses? Do thou work. When thou shalt bring me word she loves my son, I'll tell thee on the instant thou art then as great as is thy master, greater, for his fortunes all lie speechless, and his name is at last gasp. Return he cannot, nor continue where he is. To shift his being is to exchange one misery with another, and every day that comes, comes to decay a day's work in him. What shalt thou expect to be depender on a thing that leans, who cannot be new-built, nor has no friends so much as but to prop him? The queen drops the box, Pisanio takes it up. Thou takest up thou knowst not what, but take it for thy labour. It is a thing I made, which hath the king five times redeemed from death. I do not know what is more cordial. Nay, I prithee take it. It is an earnest of a further good that I mean to thee. Tell thy mistress how the case stands with her. Do it as from thyself. Think what a chance thou changest on, but think thou hast thy mistress still, to boot my son, who shall take notice of thee. I'll move the king to any shape of thy preferment such as thou desire. And then myself, I chiefly, that set thee on to this desert, am bound to load thy merit richly. Call my women. Think on my words. Exit Pisanio. A sly and constant knave, not to be shaked, the agent for his master and the remembrancer of her to hold the hand fast to her lord. I have given him that which, if he take, shall quite unpeople her of leisures for her sweet, and which she after, except she bend her humour, shall be assured taste of too. Re-enter Pisanio and ladies. So, so, well done, well done. The violets, cowslips, and the primroses bear to my closet. Fare thee well, Pisanio. Think on my words. Exeunt queen and ladies. And shall do. But when to my good lord I prove untrue, I'll choke myself. There's all I'll do for you. Exit. Scene six. The same. Another room in the palace. Enter Imogen. A father cruel, and a stepdame false, a foolish suitor to a wedded lady that hath her husband banished. Oh, that husband, my supreme crown of grief, and those repeated vexations of it. Had I been thief stolen as my two brothers, happy, but most miserable is the desire that's glorious. Blessed be those, how mean so e'er, that have their honest wills, which seasons comfort. Who may this be? Fie! Enter Pisanio and Iachimo. Madam, a noble gentleman of Rome comes from my lord with letters. Change you, madam. The worthy Leonatus is in safety and greets your highness dearly. Presents a letter. Thanks, good sir. You're kindly welcome. Aside. All of her that is out of door most rich, if she be furnished with a mind so rare, she is alone in the Arabian bird, and I have lost the wager. Boldness be my friend. Arm me, audacity, from head to foot, or, like the Parthian, I shall flying fight, rather directly fly. Reads. He is one of the noblest note to whose kindnesses I am most infinitely tied. Reflect upon him accordingly as you value your trust. Leonatus. 
So far I read aloud, but even the very middle of my heart is warmed by the rest and takes it thankfully. You are as welcome, worthy sir, as I have words to bid you, and shall find it so in all that I can do. Thanks, fairest lady. What, are men mad? Hath nature given them eyes to see this vaulted arch in the rich crop of sea and land, which can distinguish twixt the fiery orbs above and the twinned stones upon the numbered beach? And can we not partition make with spectacles so precious twixt fair and foul? What makes your admiration? It cannot be the eye, for apes and monkeys, twixt two such she's, could chatter this way and contemn the moes with the other, nor the judgment, for idiots in this case of favour would be wisely definite, nor the appetite, sluttery to such neat excellence opposed, should make desire vomit emptiness, not so allured to feed. What is the matter, Trow? The cloyed will that satiate yet unsatisfied desire, that tub both filled and running, ravening first the lamb longs after for the garbage. What, dear sir, thus wraps you? Are you well? Thanks, madam, well. To Pisanio. Beseech you, sir, desire my man's abode where I did leave him. He is strange and peevish. I was going, sir, to give him welcome. Exit. Continues well, my lord. His health beseech you. Well, madam. Is he disposed to mirth? I hope he is. Exceeding pleasant. None a stranger there, so merry and so gamesome. He is called the Briton Reveller. When he was here he did incline to sadness, and oft times not knowing why. I never saw him sad. There is a Frenchman, his companion, one an eminent monsieur, that, it seems, much loves a Gaulian girl at home. He furnaces the thick sighs from him, whiles the jolly Briton, your lord, I mean, laughs from his free lungs, cries, Oh, can my sides hold to think that man, who knows by history, report, or his own proof what woman is, yea, what she cannot choose, but must be, will his free hours languish for assured bondage? Will my lord say so? Ay, madam, with his eyes in flood with laughter. It is a recreation to be by and hear him mock the Frenchman. But heavens know, some men are much to blame. Not he, I hope. Not he. But yet heaven's bounty towards him might be used more thankfully. In himself tis much. In you, which I account his beyond all talents, Whilst I am bound to wonder, I am bound to pity, too. What do you pity, sir? Two creatures heartily. Am I one, sir? You look on me. What wreck discern you in me deserves your pity? Lamentable. What to hide me from the radiant sun and solace of the dungeon by a snuff? I pray you, sir, deliver with more openness your answers to my demands. Why do you pity me? That others do—I was about to say—enjoy your—but it is an office of the gods to venge it, not mine to speak on't. You do seem to know something of me, or what concerns me. Pray you, since doubling things go ill often hurts more than to be sure they do, for certainties either are past remedies, or timely knowing the remedy then born. Discover to me what both you spur and stop. Had I this cheek to bathe my lips upon, this hand whose touch, whose every touch, would force the feeler's soul to the oath of loyalty, this object which takes prison as the wild motion of mine eye, fixing it only here, should I be damned then, slaver with lips as common as the stairs that mount the capital, join gripes with hands made hard with hourly falsehood, falsehood as with labour, then by peeping in an eye base and unlustrous at the smoky light that's fed with stinking tallow. It were fit that all the plagues of hell should at one time encounter such revolt. My lord, I fear, hath forgot Britain. And himself. Not I inclined to this intelligence pronounce the beggary of his charge, but tis your graces that from pay mutest conscience to my tongue charms this report out let me hear no more 
oh dearest soul your cause doth strike at my heart with pity that doth make me sick a lady so fair and fastened to an empery would make the greatest king double to be partnered with tomboys hired with that self-exhibition which your own coffers yield with diseased ventures that play with all infirmities for gold which rottenness can lend nature such boiled stuff as well might poison poison be revenged or she that bore you was no queen and you recoil from your great stock revenged how should i be revenged if this be true as i have such a heart that both mine ears must not in haste abuse if it be true how should i be revenged should he make me live like diana's priest betwixt cold sheets whiles he is valuating variable rants in your despite upon your purse revenge it i dedicate myself to your sweet pleasure more noble than that runagate to your bed and will continue fast to your affection still close as sure what ho pisanio let me my service tender on your lips away i do condemn mine ears that have so long attended thee if thou wert honourable thou wouldst have told this tale for virtue not for such an end thou seek'st as base as strange thou wrong'st a gentleman who is as far from thy report as thou from honour and solicits here a lady that disdains thee and the devil alike what ho pisanio the king my father shall be made acquainted of thy assault if he shall think it fit a saucy stranger in his court to mart as in a romish stew and to expound his beastly mind to us he hath a court he little cares for and a daughter who he not respects at all what ho pisanio oh happy leonatus i may say the credit that thy lady hath of thee deserves thy trust and thy most perfect goodness her assured credit blessed live you long a lady to the worthiest sir that ever country called his and you his mistress only for the most worthiest fit give me your pardon i have spoke this to know if your affiance were deeply rooted and shall make your lord that which he is new o'er and he is one the truest mannered such a holy witch that he enchants societies into him half all men's hearts are his you make amends he sits mongst men like a descended god he hath a kind of honour sets him off more than immortal seeming be not angry most mighty princess that i have adventured to try your taking a false report which hath honoured with confirmation your great judgment in the election of a sir so rare which you know cannot err the love i bear him made me to fan you thus but the gods made you unlike all others chaffless pray your pardon all's well sir take my power of the court for yours my humble thanks i had almost forgot to entreat your grace but in a small request and yet of moment too for it concerns your lord myself and other noble friends are partners in the business pray what is't some dozen romans of us and your lord the best feather of our wing have mingled sums to buy a present for the emperor which i the factor of the rest have done in france tis plate of rare device and jewels of rich and exquisite form their value's great and i am something curious being strange to have them in a safe stowage uh, may it please you to take them in protection willingly and pawn mine honour for their safety since my lord hath interest in them i will keep them in my bedchamber they are in a trunk attended by my men i will make bold to send them to you only for this night i must aboard to-morrow oh no no yes i beseech or i shall short my word by lengthening my return from gaulia i cross the seas on purpose and on promise to see your grace i thank you for your pains but not away to-morrow oh i must madam therefore i shall beseech you if you please to greet your lord with writing do it to-night i have outstood my time which is material to the tender of our present i will write send your trunk to me it shall safe be kept and truly yielded to you you are very welcome 
Exeunt. End of Act One. Act Two of Cymbeline by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cymbeline by William Shakespeare. Act Two, Scene One. Britain before Cymbeline's palace. Enter Cloten and two lords. Was there ever man had such luck? When I kissed the jack upon an upcast to be hid away, I had a hundred pound on And then a horse and jackanapes must take me up for swearing, as if I borrowed mine oaths of him and might not spend them at my pleasure. What got he by that? You have broke his pate with your bowl. Aside. If his wit had been like him that broke it, it would have run all out. When a gentleman is disposed to swear, is it not for any standers by to curtail his oaths, huh? No, my lord. Aside. Nor crop the ears of them. Horse and dog, I give him satisfaction. Would he had been one of my rank. Aside. To have smelt like a fool. I am not vexed more at anything in the earth. A pox aunt, I'd rather not be so noble as I am. They dare not fight with me because of the queen my mother. Every jack slave hath his belly full of fighting, and I must go up and down like a cock that nobody can match. Aside. You are cock and capon too, and you crow cock with your comb on. Sayst thou? It is not fit that your lordship should undertake every companion that you give offence to. No, I know that. But it is fit I should commit offence to my inferiors. Aye, it is fit for your lordship only. Why, so I say. Did you hear of a stranger that's come to court tonight? A stranger, and I not know on't? Aside. He's a strange fellow himself, and knows it not. There's an Italian come, and, tis thought, one of Leonatus' friends. Leonatus, a banished rascal. And he's another, whosoever he be. Who told you of this, stranger? One of your lordship's pages. Is it fit I went to look upon him? Is there no derogation in't? You cannot derogate, my lord. Not easily, I think. Aside. You are a fool granted. Therefore your issues, being foolish, do not derogate. Come, I'll go see this Italian. What I have lost today at bowls, I'll win tonight of him. Come, go. I'll attend your lordship. Exeunt, Cloten, and First Lord. That such a crafty devil as is his mother should yield the world this ass, a woman that bears all down with her brain, and this her son cannot take two from twenty for his heart and leave eighteen. Alas, poor princess, thou divine Imogen, what thou endurest betwixt a father by thy stepdame governed, a mother hourly coining plots, a wooer more hateful than the foul expulsion is of thy dear husband, than that horrid act of the divorce he'll make. The heavens hold firm the walls of thy dear honour. Keep unshaked that temple, thy fair mind, that thou mayst stand, to enjoy thy banished lord and this great land. Exit. Scene 2. Imogen's Bedchamber in Cymbeline's Palace. A trunk in one corner of it. Imogen in bed, reading. A lady attending. Who's there? My woman Helen. Please you, madame. What hour is it? Almost midnight, madame. Oh, I have read three hours, then. Mine eyes are weak. Fold down the leaf where I have left. Mm, to bed. Take not away the taper. Leave it burning, and if thou canst awake by four o' the clock, I prithee call me. Oh, sleep hath seized me wholly. Exit, lady. To your protection I commend me, gods. From fairies and the tempters of the night, guard me, beseech ye. Sleeps. Yakimo comes from the trunk. The crickets sing. A man's o'er laboured sense repairs itself by rest. Our Tarquin thus did softly press the rushes ere he wakened the chastity he wounded. 
Cytheria, how bravely thou becomest thy bed, fresh lily, and whiter than the sheets, that I might touch, but kiss, one kiss, rubies unparagoned, how dearly they do it. Tis her breathing that perfumes the chamber thus. The flame of the taper bows towards her, and would underpeep her lids to see the enclosed lights, now canopied under these windows, white and azure laced with blue of heaven's own tinct. But my design to note the chamber, I will write all down. Such and such pictures there the window, such the adornment of her bed, the arras, figures, why, such and such, and the contents of the story. Ah, but some natural notes about her body. Above ten thousand meaner movables would testify to enrich mine inventory. O oh, sleep, thou ape of death, thy dull upon her, and be her sense but as a monument, thus in a chapel lying. Come off, come off. Taking off her bracelet. As slippery as the Gordian knot was hard. Tis mine. And this will witness outwardly as strongly as the conscience does within to the madding of her lord. On her left breast a mole sank spotted, like the crimson drops i' the bottom of a cowslip. Here's a voucher stronger than ever law could make. This secret will force him think I have picked the lock and ta'en the treasure of her honour. No more. To what end? Why should I write this down? That's riveted. Screw to my memory. She hath been reading late the tales of Terius. Here the leaf's turned down, where Philomel gave up. I have enough. To the trunk again, and shut the spring of it. Swift, swift, you dragons of the night, the dawning may bear the raven's eye. I lodge in fear, though this is a heavenly angel. Hell is here. Clock strikes. One, two, three. Time, time. Goes into the trunk. The scene closes. Scene three. An antechamber adjoining Imogen's apartments. Enter Cloten and Lords. Your lordship is the most patient man in loss, and the coldest that ever turned up an ace. It would make any man cold to lose. But not every man patient after the noble temper of your lordship. You are most hot and furious when you win. Winning will put any man into courage. If I could get this foolish image in, I should have gold enough. It's almost morning, is not? Day, my lord. I would this music would come. I am advised to give her music a mornings. They say it will penetrate. Enter musicians. Come on, tune. If we can penetrate her with your fingering, so. We'll try with tongue, too. If none will do, let her remain. But I'll never give o'er. First, a very excellent, good, conceited thing. After, a wonderful, sweet air with admirable, rich words to it. And then let her consider. Song. Hark, hark, the lark at heaven's gate sings, and Phoebus kins arise. His steeds to water at those springs on chaliced flowers that lies. And winking merry buds begin to up their golden eyes. With everything that pretty is, my lady sweet, arise, arise, arise. So get you gone. If this penetrate, I will consider your music the better. If it do not, it is a vice in her ears which horse-hairs and calves' guts, nor the voice of unpaved eunuch to boot can never amend. Exeunt Musicians Here comes the king. I am glad I was up so late. 
for that's the reason i was up so early he cannot choose but take this service i have done fatherly enter cymbeline and queen good morrow to your majesty and to my gracious mother attend you here the door of our stern daughter will she not forth i have assailed her with music but she vouchsafes no notice the exile of her minion is too new she hath not yet forgot him some more time must wear the print of his remembrance out and then she's yours you are most bound to the king who lets go by no vantages that may prefer you to his daughter frame yourself to orderly soliciting and be friended with aptness of the season make denials increase your services so seem as if you were inspired to do those duties which you tender to her that you in all obey her, save when command to your dismission tends, and therein you are senseless. Senseless? Not so. Enter a messenger. So like you, sir, ambassadors from Rome, the one is Caius Lucius. A worthy fellow, albeit he comes on angry purpose now, but that's no fault of his. We must receive him according to the honour of his sender, and towards himself his goodness forspent on us, we must extend our notice. Our dear son, when you have given good morning to your mistress, attend the queen and us. We shall have need to employ you towards this Roman. Come, our queen. Exeunt all but Quotin. If she be up, I'll speak with her. If not, let her lie still and dream. Knox. By your leave, ho! I know her women are about her. What if I do line one of their hands? Ah, Tis gold which buys it, but oft it doth. Yea, and makes Diana's rangers false themselves, Yield up their deer to the stand of the stealer. And tis gold which makes the true man killed, And saves the thief. Nay, sometimes hangs both thief and true man. What can it not do and undo? I will make one of her women lawyer to me, For I yet not understand the case myself. Knox. By your leave. Enter a lady. Who's there that knocks? A gentleman. No more? Yes, and a gentlewoman's son. That's more than some whose tailors are as dear as yours can justly boast of. What's your lordship's pleasure? Your lady's person, is she ready? Ay, to keep her chamber. There is gold for you. Sell me your good report. How? My good name? Or to report of you what I shall think is good, the princess. Enter Imogen. Good morrow, fairest. Sister, your sweet hand. Exit, lady. Good morrow, sir. You lay out too much pains for purchasing but trouble. The thanks I give is telling you that I am poor of thanks and scarce can spare them. Still I swear I love you. If you but said so, twere as deep with me. If you swear still, your recompense is still, that I regard it not. This is no answer. But that you shall not say I yield, being silent, I would not speak. I pray you spare me. Faith, I shall unfold equal discourtesy to your best kindness. One of your great knowing should learn, being taught, forbearance. To leave you in your madness were my sin, I will not. Fools are not mad folks. Do you call me fool? As I am mad, I do. If you'll be patient, I'll no more be mad. That cures us both. I am much sorry, sir, you put me to forget a lady's manners by being so verbal. And learn now for all that I, which know my heart, do here pronounce, by the very truth of it, I care not for you and am so near the lack of charity to accuse myself i hate you which i had rather you felt than make my boast you sin against obedience which you owe your father for the contract you pretend with that base wretch one bred of alms and fostered with cold dishes with scraps of the court is no contract none and though it be allowed in meaner parties yet who than he more mean to knit their souls on whom there is no more dependency but brats and beggary and self-figured naught yet you are curbed from that enlargement by the consequence of the crown and must not soil the precious note of it with a base slave a hiding for a livery a squire's cloth a pantler 
<laughs> not so eminent profane fellow wert thou the son of jupiter and no more but what thou art besides thou wert too base to be his groom thou wert dignified enough even to the point of envy if twere made comparative for your virtues to be styled the under hangman of his kingdom and hated for being preferred so well the south fog wrought him he never can meet more mischance than come to be but named of thee his meanest garment that ever hath but clipped his body is dearer in my respect than all the hairs above thee were they all made such men how now, Pisanio? Enter Pisanio. His garment? Now the devil! To Dorothy, my woman, hie thee presently. His garment? I am sprited with a fool, frighted and angered worse. Go bid my woman search for a jewel that too casually hath left mine arm. It was thy master's. Shrew me if I would lose it for a revenue of any kings in Europe. I do think I saw it this morning. Confident I am last night twas on mine arm, I kissed it. I hope it be not gone to tell my lord that I kiss aught but he. Twill not be lost. I hope so. Go and search. Exit Pisanio. You have abused me. His meanest garment. Ay, I said so, sir. If you will make it an action, call witness to it. I, I will inform your father. Your mother, too. She's my good lady, and will conceive, I hope, but the worst of me. So I leave you, sir, to the worst of discontent. Exit. I'll be revenged. His meanest garment. Well. Exit. Scene four. Rome. Philario's house. Enter Posthumus and Philario. Fear it not, sir. I would I were so sure to win the king, as I am bold her honour will remain hers. What means do you make to him? Not any, but abide the change of time, quake in the present winter's state, and wish that warmer days would come. In these seared hopes I barely gratify your love, they failing I must die much your debtor. Your very goodness and your company obeys all I can do. By this... Your king has heard of great Augustus, Caius Lucius, will do's commission truly, and I think he will grant the tribute, send the arrearages, or look upon our Romans, whose remembrance is yet fresh in their grief. I do believe, statest though I am none, nor like to be, that this will prove a war, and you shall hear the legions now in Gallia sooner landed in our not-fearing Britain than have tidings of any penny tribute paid. Our countrymen are men more ordered than when Julius Caesar smiled at their lack of skill but found their courage worthy his frowning at. Their discipline, now mingled with their courages, will make known to their approvers they are people such that mend upon the world. Enter Yakimo. See, si, Yakimo. The swiftest hearts have posted you by land, and winds of all the comers kissed your sails to make your vessel nimble. Welcome, sir. I hope the briefness of your answer made the speediness of your return. Your lady is one of the fairest that I have looked upon. And therewithal the best. Or let her beauty look through a casement to allure false hearts and be false with them. Here are letters for you. Their tenor good, I trust. Tis very like. Was Caius Lucius in the Britain court when you were there? He was expected then, but not approached. All is well yet. Sparkles this stone as it was wont, or is not too dull for your good wearing? If I had lost it, I should have lost the worth of it in gold. I'll make a journey twice as far to enjoy a second night of such sweet shortness which was mine in Britain, for the ring is one. The stone's too hard to come by. Not a whit, your lady being so easy. Make not, sir, your loss your sport. I hope you know that we must not continue friends. Good sir, we must, if you keep covenant. Had I not brought the knowledge of your mistress home, I grant we were to question further, but I now profess myself the winner of her honour together with your ring, and not the wronger of her or you, having proceeded but by both your wills. 
If you can make it apparent that you have tasted her in bed, my hand and ring is yours. If not, the foul opinion you had of her pure honour gains or loses your sword or mine, or masterless leaves both to who shall find them. Sir, my circumstances, being so near the truth as I will make them, must first induce you to believe, whose strength I will confirm with oath, which I doubt not you'll give me leave to spare when you shall find you need it not. Proceed. First, her bedchamber, where I confess I slept not, but profess had that was well worth watching. It was hanged with tapestry of silk and silver, the story proud Cleopatra where she met her Roman, and sideness swelled above the banks, or for the press of boats or pride. A piece of work so bravely done, so rich, that it did strive in workmanship and value, which I wondered could be so rarely and exactly wrought, since the true life on was. This is true, and this you might have heard of here, by me or by some other. More particulars must justify my knowledge. So they must, or do your honour injury. The chimney is south chamber and the chimney piece chaste dean bathing never saw i figures so likely to report themselves the cutter was another nature dumb out went her motion and breath left out this is a thing which you might from relation likewise reap being as it is much spoke of the roof of the chamber with golden cherubins is fretted her Anderons, I had forgot them, were two winking cupids of silver each on one foot standing nicely depending on their brands. This is her honour. Let it be granted you have seen all this, and praise be given to your remembrance. The description of what is in her chamber, nothing saves the wager you have laid. Then, if you can, showing the bracelet, be pale. I beg but leave to air this jewel, see, and now tis up again. Oh, it must be married to that your diamond. I'll keep them. Jove! Once more, let me behold it. Is it that which I left with her? Sir, I thank her that she stripped it from her arm. I see her yet. Her pretty action did outsell her gift, and yet enriched it too. She gave it me, and said she prized it once. Maybe she plucked it off to send it me. She writes so to you, doth she? Oh, no, 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 tis true. Here, take this too. Gives the ring. It is a basilisk unto mine eye, kills me to look on. Let there be no honour where there is beauty, truth where semblance, love where there's another man. The vows of women of no more bondage be to where they are made than they are to their virtues, which is nothing. Oh, above measure, false. Have patience, sir, and take your ring again. It is not yet warm. It may be probable she lost it, or who knows if one of her women, being corrupted, has stolen it from her. Very true, and so I hope he came by it. Back my ring, render to me some corporal sign about her, more evident than this, for this was stolen. By Jupiter, I had it from her arm. Hark you, he swears. By Jupiter, he swears. Tis true. Nay... Keep the ring, tis true. I am sure she would not lose it. Her attendants are all sworn and honourable. They induced to steal it, and by a stranger? No, he hath enjoyed her. The cognizance of her incontinency is this. She hath bought the name of whore thus dearly. There, take thy hire, and all the fiends of hell divide themselves between you. Sir, be patient, 
It is not strong enough to be believed of one persuaded well off. Never talk on She hath been colted by him. If you seek for further satisfying, under her breast, worthy the pressing, lies a mole, right proud of that most delicate lodging. By my life I kissed it, and it gave me present hunger to feed again, though full. You do remember this stain upon her? Ay, and it doth confirm another stain as big as hell can hold, were there no more but it. Will you hear more? Spare your arithmetic. Never count the turns. Once in a million. I'll be sworn. No swearing. If you will swear you have not done to you lie. And I will kill thee if thou dost deny thou'st made me cuckold. I'll deny nothing. Oh, that I had her here to tear her limb meal. I will go there and do it in the court before her father. I'll do something. Exit. Quite besides a government of patience, you have won. Let us follow him, and bear for the present trials he has against himself. Within my heart. Exeunt. Scene five. Another room in Falario's house. Enter Posthumus Leonatus. Is there no way for men to be but women must be half workers? We are all bastards. And that most venerable man which I did call my father was I know not where when I was stamped. Some coiner with his tools made me a counterfeit. Yet my mother seemed the Diane of that time. So doth my wife the nonpareil of this. Oh, vengeance, vengeance! Me of my lawful pleasure she restrained, and prayed me oft forbearance, did it with a pudency so rosy the sweet view on't might well have warmed old Saturn, that I thought her as chaste as unsunned snow. Oh, all the devils! This yellow Iacomo, in an hour, was not, or less at first, perchance he spoke not, but like a full acorned boar, a German one, cried, oh, and mounted found no opposition but what he looked for should oppose and she should from encounter guard could i find out the woman's part in me for there's no motion that tends to vice in man but i affirm it is the woman's part be it lying note it the woman's flattering hers deceiving hers lust and rank thoughts hers hers revenges hers ambitions covetings change of prides disdain nice longing slanders mutability all faults that may be named nay that hell knows why hers in part or all but rather all for even to vice they are not constant but are changing still one vice but of a minute old for one not half so old as that i'll write against them detest them curse them yet tis greater skill in a true hate to pray they have their will the very devils cannot plague them better exit end of act two Act Three of Cymbeline by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cymbeline by William Shakespeare. Act Three, Scene One. Britain, a hall in Cymbeline's palace. Enter in state Cymbeline, Queen, Cloten and lords at one door, and at another, Caius Lucius and attendants. Now say, what would Augustus Caesar with us? When Julius Caesar, whose remembrance yet lives in men's eyes, and will to ears and tongues be theme and hearing ever, was in this Britain, and conquered it, Cassibelin, thine uncle, famous in Caesar's praises, no whit less than in his feats deserving it, for him and his succession granted Rome a tribute, yearly three thousand pounds, which by thee lately is left untendered. And, to kill the marvel, shall be so ever. 
there be many caesars ere such another julius britain is a world by itself and we will nothing pay for wearing our own noses that opportunity which then they had to take from us to resume we have again remember sir my liege the kings your ancestors together with the natural bravery of your isle which stands as neptune's park ribbed and paled in with rocks unscalable and roaring waters with sands that will not bear your enemies' boats but suck them up to the topmast. A kind of conquest Caesar made here, but made not here his brag of came and saw and overcame. With shame, that first that ever touched him, he was carried from off our coast twice beaten, and his shipping, poor ignorant baubles, upon our terrible seas, like eggshells moved upon their surges, cracked as easily against our rocks. For joy whereof, the famed Cassibelan, who was once at point, O Giglo Fortune, to master Caesar's sword, made Lud's town with rejoicing fires bright, and Britain's strut with courage. Come, there's no more tribute to be paid. Our kingdom is stronger than it was at that time, and, as I said, there is no more such Caesars. Other of them may have such crooked noses, but to owe such straight arms, none. Son, let your mother end. We have yet many among us can gripe as hard as Cassibelan. I, I do not say I am one, but I have a hand. Why tribute? Why should we pay tribute? If Caesar could hide the sun from us with a blanket or put the moon in his pocket, we will pay him tribute for light. Else, sir, no more tribute, pray you now. You must know, till the injurious Romans did extort this tribute from us, we were free caesar's ambition which swelled so much that it did almost stretch the sides of the world against all colour here did put the yoke upon us which to shake off becomes a warlike people whom we reckon ourselves to be with lords we do say then to caesar our ancestor was that mulmutius which ordained our laws whose use the sword of caesar hath too much mangled whose repair and franchise shall by the power we hold be our good deed though rome be therefore angry malmutius made our laws who was the first of britain which did put his brows within a golden crown and called himself a king i am sorry cymbeline that i am to pronounce augustus caesar caesar that hath more kings his servants than thyself domestic officers thine enemy receive it from me then war and confusion in caesar's name pronounce i gainst thee look for fury not to be resisted thus defied i thank thee for myself thou art welcome caius thy caesar knighted me my youth i spent much under him of him i gathered honour which he to seek of me again perforce behoves me keep at utterance i am perfect that the pannonians and dalmatians for their liberties are now in arms a precedent which not to read would show the britons cold so caesar shall not find them let proof speak his majesty bids you welcome make pastime with us a day or two or longer if you seek us afterwards in other terms, you shall find us in our salt-water girdle. If you beat us out of it, it is yours. If you fall in the adventure, our crows shall fare the better for you. And there's an end. So, sir. I know your master's pleasure, and he mine. All the remain is welcome. Exeunt. Scene two. Another room in the palace. Enter Pisanio with a letter. How? Of adultery? Wherefore write you not what monsters her accuser? Leonatus, O master, what a strange infection is fallen into thy ear! What false Italian, as poison-tongued as handed, hath prevailed on thy too ready hearing? Disloyal? No, she's punished for her truth, and undergoes more goddess-like than wife-like such assaults as would take in some virtue. O oh, my master, thy mind to her is now as low as were thy fortunes. How, that I should murder her? Upon the love and truth and vows which I have made to thy command. I, her, her blood? 
If it be so to do good service, never let me be counted serviceable. How look I that I should seem to lack humanity so much as this fact comes to? Reading. Do it. The letter that I have sent her, by her own command, shall give the opportunity. O oh, damned paper! Black as the ink that's on thee, senseless bauble! Art thou a feodary for this act, and look'st so virgin-like without? Lo, here she comes. I am ignorant in what I am commanded. Enter Imogen. How now, Pisanio? Madam, here is a letter from my lord. Who? Thy lord? That is my lord, Leonatus. Oh, learned indeed were that astronomer that knew the stars as I his characters. He'd lay the future open. You good gods, let what is here contained relish of love, of my lord's health, of his content. Yet not that we two are asunder. Let that grieve him. Some griefs are medicinable. That is one of them, for it doth physic love. Of his content all but in that. Oh, good wax thy leave. Blessed be you bees that make these locks of counsel. Lovers and men in dangerous bonds pray not alike. Though forfeiters you cast in prison, yet you clasp young Cupid's tables. Oh, good news, gods! Reads. Justice, and your father's wrath, should he take me in his dominion, could not be so cruel to me as you, O oh, the dearest of creatures, would even renew me with your eyes. Take notice, that I am in Cambria, at, if one of mean of Milford Haven, what your own love will out of this advice you follow. So he wishes you all happiness that remains loyal to his vow, and your increasing in love, Leonatus Posthumus. Oh, for a horse with wings! Hearest thou, Pisanio? He is at Milford Haven. Read, and tell me how far tis thither. If one of mean affairs may plod it in a week, why may not I glide thither in a day? Then, true Pisanio, who long'st like me to see thy lord, who long'st, let me bait, but not like me, yet long'st but in a fainter kind, oh, not like me! For mine's beyond, beyond. Say and speak thick. Love's counsellor should fill the bores of hearing to the smothering of the sense. How far it is to this same blessed Milford! And by the way, tell me how Wales was to inherit such a haven. But first of all, how we may steal from hence, and for the gap that we shall make in time, from our hence going and our return to excuse. But first, how get hence? Why should excuse be born or e'er begot? We'll talk of that hereafter. Prithee speak. How many score of miles may we well ride twixt hour and hour? One score twixt sun and sun, madam's enough for you. Aside. And too much, too. Why, one that rode to his execution, man, could never go so slow. I have heard of riding wagers where horses have been nimbler than the sands that run in the clock's behalf. But this is foolery. Go bid my woman feign a sickness, say she'll home to her father, and provide me presently a riding-suit, no costlier than would fit a Franklin's housewife. Madam, your best consider. I see before me, man, nor here, nor here, nor what ensues, but have a fog in them that I cannot look through. Away, I prithee, do as I bid thee. There's no more to say. Accessible is none but Milford way. Exeunt. Scene three. Wales, a mountainous country with a cave. Enter from the cave, Belarius, Gildarius, and Arviragus following. A goodly day not to keep house for such whose roofs as low as ours. Stoop, boys, this gate instructs you how to adore the heavens and bows you to a morning's holy office. The gates of monarchs are arched so high. The giants may jet through, and keep their impious turbans on, without good morning to the sun. Hail, thou fair heaven! We house in the rock, yet use thee not so hardly as proud livers do. Hail heaven! Hail heaven! Now for our mountain sport, up to yon hill. Your legs are young, I'll tread these flats. Consider, when you above perceive me like a crow, that it is place which lessens and sets off, 
and you may then reward what tales I have told you of courts, of princes, of the tricks in war. This service is not service, being so done, but being so allowed. To apprehend thus draws us a profit from all things we see, and often, to our comfort, shall we find the sharded beetle in a safer hold than is the full-winged eagle. Oh, this life is nobler than attending for a check, richer than doing nothing for a bauble, prouder than rustling in unpaid-for silk. Such gain the cup of him that makes him fine, he keeps his book uncrossed. No life to ours. Out of your proof you speak. We, poor unfledged, have never winged from view of the nest, nor know not what airs from home. Happily, this life is best, if quiet life be best. Sweeter to you that have a sharper known, Well corresponding with your stiff age. But unto us it is a cell of ignorance, Travelling a bed, a prison for a debtor, That not dares to stride a limit. What should we speak of when we are old as you? When we shall hear the rain and wind beat dark December, How in this our pitchy cave Shall we discourse the freezing hours away? We have seen nothing, we are beastly, subtle as the fox for prey, like or like as the wolf for what we eat. Our valour is to chase what flies. Our cage we make a choir, as doth the present bard, and sing our bondage freely. How oh, you speak! Did you but know the city's usuries, and felt them knowingly? The art of the court is hard to leave as keep, whose top to climb is certain falling, or so slippery that the fear's as bad as falling, the toil of the war, a pain that only seems to seek out danger in the name of fame and honour, which dies in the search, and hath as off a slanderous epitaph as a record of fair act. Nay, many times doth ill deserve by doing well. What's worse, must courtesy of the censure? Oh, boys, this story the world may read in me. My body's marked with Roman swords, and my report was once first with the best of note. Cymbeline loved me, and when a soldier was the theme, my name was not far off. Then was I as a tree whose bows did bend with fruit, but in one night, a storm or robbery, call it what you will, shook down my mellow hangings, nay, my leaves, and left me bare to weather. Uncertain favour. My fault being nothing, as I have told you oft, but that two villains, whose false oaths prevailed before my perfect honour, swore to Cymbeline I was confederate with the Romans, so followed my banishment, and this twenty years this rock and these demeans have been my world. What I have lived at honest freedom, paid more pious debts to heaven than in all the fore-end of my time. But up to the mountains, this is not Hunter's language, he that strikes the venison first shall be lord of the feast, to him the other two shall minister, and we will fear no poison which attends in place of great estate. I'll meet you in the valleys. Exeunt Gildarius and Averigus. How hard it is to hide the sparks of nature. These boys know little they are soons to the king, nor Cymbeline dreams that they are alive. They think they are mine, although trained up thus meanly in the cave wherein they bow, their thoughts do hit the roofs of palaces, and nature prompts them in simple and low things to prince it much beyond the trick of others. This Polydor, the heir of Cymbeline and Britain, who the king his father called Guderius, Jove, when on my three-foot stool I sit and tell the warlike feats I have done, his spirits fly out into my story, say, Thus my enemy fell, and thus I set my foot on's neck. Even then the princely blood flows in his cheek, he sweats, strains his young nerves, and puts himself in posture that acts my words. The younger brother, Cadwal, once Aviragus, as in as like a figure, strikes life into my speech and shows much more his own conceiving. Hark, the game is roused. O oh, Cymbeline, heaven and my conscience knows thou didst unjustly banish me, 
whereon at three and two years old I stole these babes, thinking to bear thee of succession, as thou reftst me of my lands. Euryphile, thou wast their nurse. They took thee for their mother, and every day do honour to her grave. Myself, Bellarius, that am Morgan called, they take for natural father. The game is up. Exit. Scene four. Country near Milford Haven. Enter Pisanio and Imogen. Thou toldst me when we came from horse the place was near me first as I had hand. Ne'er longed my mother so to see me first as I have now. Pisanio, man, where is Posthumus? What is in thy mind that makes thee stare thus? Wherefore breaks that sigh from the inward of thee? One but painted thus would be interpreted a thing perplexed beyond self-explication. Put thyself into a haviour of less fear, ere wildness vanquish my stater senses. What's the matter? Why tenderest thou that paper to me with a look untender? If it be summer news, smile to it before. If winterly thou needst but keep that countenance still. My husband's hand? That drug-damned Italy hath outcraftied him, and he's at some hard point. Speak, man! Thy tongue may take off some extremity which to read would be even mortal to me. Please you, read. And you testimonies whereof should man a thing the most disdained of fortune. Reads. Thy mistress, Pisanio, hath played the strumpet in my bed. The testimonies whereof lie bleeding in me. I speak not out of weak surmises, but from proof as strong as my grief, and as certain as I expect my revenge. That part thou, Pisanio, must act for me, if my faith be not tainted with the breach of hers. Let thine own hands take away her life. I shall give thee opportunity at Milford Haven. She hath my letter for the purpose, where, if thou fear to strike, and to make me certain it is done, thou art the pander to her dishonour, and equally to me disloyal. What shall I need to draw my sword? The paper hath cut her throat already. No, tis slander, whose edge is sharper than the sword, whose tongue outvenoms all, whose breath rides on the posting winds, and doth belie all corners of the world. Kings, queens, and states, maids, matrons, nay, the secrets of the grave, this viperous slander enters. What cheer, madam? False to his bed? Oh, what is it to be false? To lie and watch there, and to think on him? To weep twixt clock and clock? If sleep charge nature to break it with a fearful dream of him, and cry myself awake? That's false to his bed, is it? Alas, good lady. Ay, false! Thy conscience witness. Iachimo, thou didst accuse him of incontinency. Then thou look'st like a villain. Now methinks thy favour's good enough. Some jay of Italy, whose mother was her painting, hath betrayed him. Poor am I, stale, a garment out of fashion. And, for I am richer than to hang by the walls, I must be ripped to pieces with me. Oh, men's vows are women's traitors. All good seeming by thy revolt, O husband, shall be thought put on for villainy. Not born where it grows, but worn a bait for ladies. Good madam, hear me. True, honest men, being heard, like false Aeneas, were in his time thought false. And Sinon's weeping did scandal many a holy tear, took pity from most true wretchedness. So thou, posthumous, wilt lay the leaven on all proper men. Goodly and gallant shall be false and perjured from thy great fall. Come, fellow, be thou honest, do thou thy master's bidding. When thou seest him, a little witness my obedience. Look, I draw the sword myself. Take it, and hit the innocent mansion of my love, my heart. Fear not, tis empty of all things but grief. Thy master is not there who was indeed the riches of it. Do his bidding. Strike. Thou mayst be valiant in a better cause, but now thou seem'st a coward. Hence, vile instrument, thou shalt not damn my hand. 
Why, I must die, and if I do not by thy hand, thou art no servant of thy master's. Against self-slaughter there is a prohibition so divine that cravens my weak hand. Come, here's my heart. Some things are for it. Soft, soft will no defence, obedient as the scabbard. What is here? The scriptures of the loyal Leonatus all turned to heresy. Away, away, corruptors of my faith! You shall no more be stomachers to my heart. Thus may poor fools believe false teachers. Though those that are betrayed do feel the treason sharply, yet the traitor stands in worse case of woe. And thou, posthumous, thou that didst set up my disobedience gainst the king my father, and make me put into contempt the suits of princely fellows, shalt hereafter find it is no act of common passage, but a strain of rareness, and I grieve myself to think when thou shalt be disedged by her that now thou tirest on, how thy memory will then be panged by me. Prithee, dispatch. The lamb entreats the butcher. Where's thy knife? Thou art too slow to do thy master's bidding when I desire it too. O oh, gracious lady, since I received command to do this business, I have not slept one wink. Do it, and to bed, then. I'll wake mine eyeballs blind first. Wherefore, then, didst undertake it? Why hast thou abused so many miles with a pretense? This place, mine action and thine own, our horse's labour, the time inviting thee, the perturbed court for my being absent, whereunto I never purpose return. Why hast thou gone so far to be unbent when thou hast ta'en thy stand, the elected dear before thee? But to win time to lose so bad employment, in the which I have considered of a course. Good lady, hear me with patience. Talk thy tongue weary. Speak, I have heard I am a strumpet, and mine ear therein false struck can take no greater wound, nor tent to bottom that. But speak! Then, madam, I thought you would not back again. Most like, bringing me here to kill me. Not so, neither. But if I were as wise as honest, then my purpose would prove well. It cannot be but that my master is abused, some villain, ay, and singular in his art, hath done you both this cursed injury. Some Roman courtesan? No, on my life. I'll give but notice you are dead, and send him some bloody sign of it, for it is commanded I should do so. You shall be missed at court, and that will well confirm it. Why, good fellow, what shall I do the while? Where bide? How live? Or in my life what comfort when I am dead to my husband? If you'll back to the court. No court, no father, nor no more ado with that harsh, noble, simple nothing, that cloten, whose love-suit hath been to me as fearful as a siege. If not at court, then not in Britain must you abide. Where, then? Hath Britain all the sun that shines? Day, night, are they not but in Britain? The world's volume our Britain seems as of it, but not in it. In a great pool a swan's nest. Prithee, think there's livers out of Britain. I am most glad you think of other places. The ambassador, Lucius the Roman, comes to Milford Haven to-morrow. Now, if you could wear a mind dark as your fortune is, and but disguise that which, to appear itself, must not yet be but by self-danger, you should tread a course pretty and full of view, yea, haply, near the residence of Posthumus, so nigh, at least, that though his actions were not visible, yet report should render him hourly to your ear as truly as he moves. Oh, for such means! Though peril to my modesty, not death on it I would adventure. Well, then, here's the point. You must forget to be a woman, change command into obedience, fear and niceness, the handmaids of all women, or, more truly, woman its pretty self, into a waggish courage, ready in jibes, quick-answered, saucy, and as querulous as the weasel. Nay, you must forget that rarest treasure of your cheek, exposing it, but, oh, the harder heart! Alack, no remedy! to the greedy touch of common-kissing titan, and forget your laboursome and dainty trims, wherein you made great Juno angry. Nay, be brief. I see into thy end. 
and am almost a man already. First, make yourself but like one. For thinking this, I have already fit. Tis in my cloak-bag. Doublet, hat, hose, all that answer to them. Would you in their serving, and with that imitation you can borrow from youth of such a season. For noble Lucius, present yourself, desire his service, tell him wherein you're happy, which you'll make him know, if that his head have ear in music. Doubtless with joy he will embrace you, for he's honourable, and doubling that, most holy. Your means abroad you have me, rich, and I will never fail, beginning nor supplement. Thou art all the comfort the gods will diet me with. Prithee, away, there's more to be considered, but will even all that good time will give us. This attempt I am soldier to, and will abide it with a prince's courage. Away, I prithee. Well, madam, we must take a short farewell, lest, being missed, I be suspected of your carriage from the court. My noble mistress, here is a box. I had it from the queen. What's in it is precious. If you are sick at sea, or stomach qualmed at land, a dram of this will drive away distemper. To some shade, and fit you to your manhood. May the gods direct you to the best. Amen. I thank thee. Exeunt severally. Scene five. A room in Cymbeline's palace. Enter Cymbeline, Queen, Cloten, Lucius, Lords, and attendants. Thus far, and so farewell. Thanks, royal sir. My emperor hath wrote, I must from hence, and am right sorry that I must report ye my master's enemy. Our subjects, sir, will not endure his yoke, and for ourself to show less sovereignty than they must needs appear unkinglike. So, sir. I desire of you a conduct overland to Milford Haven. Madam, all joy befall your grace. And you. My lords, you are appointed for that office. The due of honour in no point omit. So farewell, noble Lucius. Your hand, my lord. Receive it friendly. But from this time forth I wear it as your enemy. Sir, the event is yet to name the winner. Fare you well. Leave not the worthy Lucius, good my lords, till he have crossed the Severn. Happiness. Exeunt Lucius and Lords. He goes hence frowning, but it honours us that we have given him cause. Tis all the better your valiant Britons have their wishes in it. Lucius hath wrote already to the Emperor how it goes here. It fits us therefore ripely our chariots and our horsemen be in readiness. The powers that he already hath in Gallia will soon be drawn to head, from whence he moves his war for Britain. Tis not sleepy business, but must be looked to speedily and strongly. Our expectation that it would be thus hath made us forward. But, my gentle queen, where is our daughter? She hath not appeared before the Roman, nor to us hath tendered the duty of the day. She looks us like a thing more made of malice than of duty. We have noted it. Call her before us, for we have been too slight in sufferance. Exit an attendant. Royal sir, since the exile of Posthumus, most retired hath her life been. The cure whereof, my lord, tis time must do. Beseech your majesty, forbear sharp speeches to her. She's a lady so tender of rebukes that words are strokes and strokes death to her. Re-enter attendant. Where is she, sir? How can her contempt be answered? Please you, sir, her chambers are all locked, and there is no answer that will be given to the loudest noise we make. My lord, when last I went to visit her, she prayed me to excuse her keeping close, whereto constrained by her infirmity, she should that duty leave unpaid to you which daily she was bound to proffer. This she wished me to make known, but our great court made me to blame in memory. Her doors locked? Not seen of late? Grant heavens that which I fear prove false. Exit. Son, I say, follow the king. That man of hers, Pisanio, her old servant, I have not seen these two days. Go, look after. Exit Cloten. Pisanio, thou that stand so for posthumous, he hath a drug of mine. 
I pray his absence proceed by swallowing that, for he believes it is a thing most precious. But for her where is she gone? Haply despair hath seized her, or, winged with fervour of her love, she's flown to her desired posthumous. Gone she is, to death or to dishonour, and my end can make good use of either. She being down, I have the placing of the British crown. Re-enter, Colton. How now, my son? Tis certain she is fled. Go in and cheer the king. He rages. None dare come about him. Aside. All the better. May this night forestall him of the coming day. Exit. I love and hate her, for she's fair and royal, and that she hath all courtly parts more exquisite than lady, ladies, woman. From every one the best she hath, and she of all compounded outsells them all. I love her, therefore, but disdaining me and throwing favours on the low posthumous slanders so her judgment that what's else rare is choked. And in that point I will conclude to hate her, nay, indeed, to be revenged upon her. For when fools shall enter Pisanio, who is here? What are you packing, Sirrah? Come hither. Ha, you precious pander! Villain, where is thy lady? In a word, or else thou art straightway with the fiends. Oh, good my lord. Where is thy lady? Or by Jupiter, I will not ask again. Close, villain, I'll have this secret from thy heart, or rip thy heart to find it. Is she with Posthumus? From those so many weights of baseness cannot a dram of worth be drawn. Alas, my lord, how can she be with him? When was she missed? He is in Rome. Where is she, sir? Come nearer, no further halting. Satisfy me home what is become of her. Oh, my all-worthy lord. All-worthy villain! Discover where thy mistress is at once, at the next word. No more of worthy lord. Speak or thy silence on the instant is thy condemnation and thy death. Then, sir, this paper is the history of my knowledge touching her flight. Presenting a letter. Let's see it. I will pursue her even to Augustus' throne. Aside. Or this, or perish. She's far enough, and what he learns by this may prove his travel, not her danger. Hum. Aside. I'll write to my lord she's dead. O oh, Imogen, safe mayst thou wander, safe return again. Sirrah, is this letter true? Sir, as I think. It is posthumous hand, I note. Sirrah, if thou wouldst not be a villain, but do me true service, undergo those employments wherein I should have cause to use thee with a serious industry, that is, what villainy so e'er I bid thee do to perform it directly and truly? I would think thee an honest man. Thou shouldst neither want my means for thy relief, nor my voice for thy preferment. Well, my good lord. Wilt thou serve me? For since patiently and constantly thou hast stuck to the bare fortune of that beggar posthumous, thou canst not in the course of gratitude but be a diligent follower of mine. Wilt thou serve me? Sir, I will. Ah, give me thy hand. Here's my purse. Hast any of thy late master's garments in thy possession? I have, my lord, at my lodging, the same suit he wore when he took leave of my lady and mistress. The first service thou dost me, fetch that suit hither. Let it be thy lint service. Go. I shall, my lord. Exit. Meet thee at Milford Haven. I forgot to ask him one thing. I'll remember it anon. Even there, thou villain posthumous, will I kill thee. I would these garments were come. She said upon a time, the bitterness of it I now belch from my heart, that she held the very garment of posthumous in more respect than my noble and natural person, together with the adornment of my qualities. With that suit upon my back will I ravish her, first kill him, and in her eyes. There shall she see my valour, which will then be a torment to her contempt. He on the ground, my speech of insultment ended on his dead body, and when my lust hath dined, 
which, as I say, to vex her I will execute in the clothes that she so praised. To the court I'll knock her back, foot her home again. She hath despised me rejoicingly, and I'll be merry in my revenge. Re-enter Pisanio with the clothes. Be those the garments? Ay, my noble lord. How long is't since she went to Milford Haven? She can scarce be there yet. Bring this apparel to my chamber. That is the second thing that I have commanded thee. The third is that thou wilt be a voluntary mute to my design. Be but duteous, and true preferment shall tender itself to thee. My revenge is now at Milford. Would I had wings to follow it. Come, and be true. Exit. Thou bidst me to my loss, for true to thee were to prove false, which I will never be, to him that is most true. To Milford go, and find not her whom thou pursuest. Flow, flow, you heavenly blessings on her. This fool's speed be crossed with slowness. Labor be his meed. Exit. Scene six. Wales. Before the cave of Valerius. Enter Imogen in boy's clothes. Oh, I see a man's life is a tedious one. I have tired myself, and for two nights together have made the ground my bed. I should be sick, but that my resolution helps me. Milford, when from the mountain top Pisanio showed thee, thou wast within a ken. Oh, Jove, I think foundations fly the wretched, such, I mean, where they should be relieved. Two beggars told me I could not miss my way. Will poor folks lie that have afflictions on them, knowing tis a punishment or trial? Yes, no wonder when rich ones scarce tell true. To lapse in fullness is sorer than to lie for need, and falsehood is worse in kings than beggars. My dear Lord, thou art one of the false ones. Now I think on thee my hunger's gone, but even before I was at point to sink for food. But what is this? Here's a path to it. Tis some savage hold. I were best not to call. I dare not call. Yet famine, ere clean it o'er thrown nature, makes it valiant. Plenty and priest breeds cowards. Hardness ever of hardiness is mother. Ho! Who's here? If anything that's civil, speak. If savage, take or lend. Ho! No answer. Then I'll enter. Best draw my sword. And if mine enemy but fear the sword like me, he'll scarcely look on't. Oh, such a foe, good heavens! Exit to the cave. Enter Belarius, Gidarius, and Arviragus. You, Polydot, have proved best woodman and our master of the feast. Cadwell and I will play the cook and servant. Tis our match. The sweat of industry would dry and die, but for the end it works to. Come, our stomachs can make what's homely savoury. Weariness can snore upon the flint, when resty sloth finds the down pillow hard. Now peace be here, poor house that keeps thyself. I am thoroughly weary. I am weak with style, yet strong in appetite. There is cold meat in the cave. We'll browse on that whilst what we have killed be cooked. Looking into the cave. Stay, come not in, but that it eats our victuals, I should think here were a fairy. What's the matter, sir? By Jupiter, an angel, or if not, an earthly paragon. Behold divineness, no elder than a boy. Re-enter Imogen. Good masters, harm me not. Before I entered here I called, and thought to have begged or bought what I have took. Good troth, I have stolen naught, nor would not, though I had found gold strewed to the floor. Here's money for my meat. I would have left it on the board so soon as I had made my meal, and parted with prayers for the provider. Money? Youth? All gold and silver rather turned to dart, as it is no better account but of those who worship dirty gods. I see you're angry. No, if you kill me for my fault, I should have died had I not made it. With a bound. To Milford Haven. What's your name? Fideli, sir. 
I have a kinsman who is bound for Italy. He embarked at Milford, to whom being going, almost spent with hunger, I am fallen in this offence. Pray thee, fair youth, think us no churls, nor measure our good minds by this rude place we live in. Well encountered. Tis almost night. You shall have better cheer ere you depart. And thanks to stay and eat it. Boys, bid him welcome. Were you a woman, youth, I should woo hard but be your groom. In honesty, I bid for you as I'd buy. I'll make it my comfort. He is a man. I love him as my brother, and such a welcome as I'd give to him. After long absence, such is yours. Most welcome. Be sprightly, for you fall amongst the friends. Amongst friends, if brothers. Aside. Would it had been so, that they had been my father's sons. Then had my prize been less, and so more equal ballasting to thee, Posthumus. He rings at some distress. Would I could free it. Or oh, I, whatever it be, what pain it cost, what danger, guards. Hark, boys. Whispering. Great men, that had no court bigger than this cave, that did attend themselves, and had the virtue which their own conscience sealed them, laying by that nothing gift of differing multitudes, could not outpeer these twain. Pardon me, gods, I'd change my sex to be companion with them, since Leonatus is false. It shall be so. Boys, we'll go dress our hunt. Fair youth, come in. Discourse is heavy, fasting. When we have supped, we'll mannerly demand of thee thy story, so far as thou wilt speak it. Pray, draw near. Tonight to the owl, and morn to the lark, less welcome. Thanks, sir. I pray, draw near. Exeunt. Scene 7. Rome, a public place. Enter two senators and tribunes. This is the tenor of the Emperor's writ, that since the common men are now in action against the Pannonians and Dalmatians, and that the legions now in Gallia are full weak to undertake our wars against the fallen-off Britons, that we do incite the gentry to this business. He creates Lucius Preconsul, and to you, the tribunes, for this immediate levy, he commends his absolute commission. Long live Caesar! Is Lucius general of the forces? Aye. Remaining now in Gallia? With those legions which I have spoke of, whereunto your levy must be suppliant, the words of your commission will tie you to the numbers and the time of their dispatch. We will discharge our duty. Exeunt. End of Act 3. Act 4 of Cymbeline by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Four of Cymbeline by William Shakespeare. Scene One Wales, near the cave of Belarius. Enter Cloten. I am near to the place where they should meet, if Pisanio have mapped it truly. How fit his garments serve me! Why should his mistress, who was made by him that made the tailor, not be fit too? The rather, saving reverence for the word, for tis said a woman's fitness comes by fits. Therein I must play the workman. <laughs> I dare speak it to myself. For it is not vain glory for a man and his glass to confer in his own chamber. I mean... The lines of my body are as well drawn as his. No less young, more strong, not beneath him in fortunes, beyond him in the advantage of the time, above him in birth, alike conversant in general services, and more remarkable in single oppositions. Yet this imperseverant thing loves him in my despite. <laughs> what mortality is! Posthumous thy head, which now is growing upon thy shoulders, shall within this hour be off. Thy mistress enforced, thy garments cut to pieces before thy face, and all this done, spurn her home to her father, who may haply be a little angry for my so rough usage. 
but my mother, having power of his testiness, shall turn all into my commendations. My horse is tied up safe. Out, sword, and to a sore purpose. Fortune put them into my hand. This is the very description of their meeting-place, and the fellow dares not deceive me. Exit. Scene two, Before the Cave of Belarius. Enter from the cave, Belarius, Gidarius, Arvirigus, and Imogen. Belarius to Imogen. You are not well. Remain here in the cave. We'll come to you after hunting. Arvirigus to Imogen. Brother, stay here. Are we not brothers? So man and man should be. But clay and clay differs in dignity, whose dust is both alike. Oh, I am very sick. Go you to hunting. I'll abide with him. So sick I am not, yet I am not well, but not so citizen a wanton as to seem to die ere sick. So please you, leave me. Stick to your journal course. The breach of custom is breach of all. I am ill, but your being by me cannot amend me. Society is no comfort to one not sociable. I am not very sick, since I can reason of it. Pray you trust me here. I'll rob none but myself, and let me die stealing so poorly. I love thee. I have spoke it how much the quantity, the weight as much as I do love my father. What? Who? Who? If it be seen to say so, I yock me in my good brother's fault. I know not why I love this youth, and I have heard you say, love's reason is without reason. To appear at door, and the demand, who is it shall die, I would say, my father, not this youth. Aside. Oh, noble strain, a worthiness of nature, breed of greatness, cowards, father, cowards, and base things, sire, base. Nature hath meal and bran, contempt and grace. I am not their father, yet who should this be doth miracle itself loved before me? Tis the ninth hour of the morn. Brother, farewell. I wish ye sport. You held. So please you, sir. Aside. These are kind creatures. Gods! What lies I have heard! Our courtiers say all's savage but at court. Experience, oh, thou disprovest report! The imperious seas breed monsters, for the dish pour tributary rivers as sweet fish. Ah, oh, I am sick still, heart-sick. Pisanio, I'll now taste of thy drug. Swallows some. I could not stir him. He said he was gentle, but unfortunate, dishonestly afflicted, but yet honest. Does did he answer me, yet say, hereafter I might know more. To the field, to the field, we'll leave you for this time, go in and rest. We will not be long away. Pray be not sick, for you must be our housewife. Well or ill, I am bound to you. And shall be ever. Exit Imogen to the cave. This youth, however distressed, appears he hath had good ancestors. How angel-like he seems! But his neat cookery, he cut our roots and characters, and sauced our broths, as Juno had been sick, and he her dieter. Nobly he yokes, is smiling with his shy, as if the shy was that he was for not being such a smile. The smile mocking the shy that he do fly, from so divine a temple to comics, with wings that sailors rail at. I do note that grief and patience, rooted in him both, mingle their spurs together. Grow patience, and let the stinking elder grieve on twine, his perishing root with the increasing vine. It is great morning. Come away. Who's there? Enter Cloten. I cannot find these runagates. That villain hath mocked me. Oh, I am faint. Those runagates, 
Means he not o' us? I partly know him. Tis Cloten, the son of the Queen. I fear some ambush. I saw him not these many years, and yet I know tis he. We're held as outlaws. Hence! He is but one. You and my brother, search what companies are near. Pray you, away. Let me alone with him. Exit Valerius and Arviragus. Soft! What are you that fly me thus? Some villain mountaineers? I have heard of such. What slave art thou? A thing more slavish did I ne'er than answering a slave without a knock. Thou art a robber, a lawbreaker, a villain. Yield thee, thief. To who? To thee? What art thou? Have not I an arm as big as thine, a heart as big? Thy words, I grant, are bigger, for I wear not my dagger in my mouth. Say what thou art, why I should yield to thee. Thou villain base, know'st me not by my clothes? No, nor thy tailor, rascal, who is thy grandfather. He made those clothes which, as it seems, make thee. Thou precious varlet, my tailor made them not. Hence, then, and thank the man that gave them thee. Thou art some fool. I am loath to beat thee. Thou injurious thief, hear but my name, and tremble. What's thy name? Clotten, thou villain. Clotten, thou double villain be thy name. I cannot tremble at it. Were it toad or adder? Spider, twould move me sooner. To thy further fear, nay, to thy mere confusion, thou shalt know I am son to the queen. I am sorry for it, not seeming so worthy as thy birth. Art not afeard? Those that I reverence, those I fear, the wise. At fools I laugh not fear them die the death when i have slain thee with my proper hand i'll follow those that even now fled hence and on the gates of lud's town set your heads yield rustic mountaineer exeunt fighting re-enter belarius and arviragus no companies abroad none in the world you did mistake him sure i cannot tell long is it since i saw him but time hath nothing blurred those lines of favour which then he wore the snatches in his voice and burst of speaking were as his i am absolute twas very cloten in this place we left them i wish my brother may good time with him you say he so fell being scarce made up i mean to man he had not apprehension of roaring terrors but the effect of judgment is oft the cause of fear but see thy brother Re-enter Gedarius with Cloten's head. <sighs> this Cloten was a fool. An empty purse. There was no money in it. Not Hercules could have knocked out his brains, for he had none. Yet I, not doing this, the fool had borne my head as I do his. What hast thou done? I am perfect, what? Cut off one Clotten's head, son to the queen, after his own report, who called me traitor, mountaineer, and swore with his own single hand he had take us in, displace our heads, where, thank the gods, they grow, and set them on Ludstown. We are all undone. Why, worthy father, what have we to lose? but that he swore to take our lives. The law protects not us. Then why should we be tender to let an arrogant piece of flesh threat us, play judge and executioner all himself? For we do fear the law. What company discover you abroad? No single soul can we set eyes on, but in all safe reason he must have some attendance. Though his humour was nothing but mutation, ay, and that, from one bad thing to worse, 
not frenzy not absolute madness could so far have raved to bring him here alone although perhaps it may be heard at court that such as we cave here hunt here are outlaws and in time may make some stronger head the which he hearing as tis like him might break out and swear he'll fetch us in yet it's not probable to come alone either he so undertaking or they so suffering then on good ground we fear if we do fear this body hath a tail more perilous than the head let ordinance come as the gods foresay it howsoever my brother hath done well i had no mind to hunt this day the boy for daily sickness did make my way long forth with his own sword which he did wave against my throat i have ta'en his head from him i'll throw it into the creek behind our rock and let it to the sea and tell the fishes he's the queen's son clotten that's all i reck exit i fear it will be revenged would polydote thou hadst not done't though valour becomes thee well enough would i had done it so the revenge alone pursued me polydore i love thee brotherly but envy much thou hast robbed me of this deed i owed revenges that possible strength might meet would seek us true and put us to our answer well tis done we'll hunt no more to-day nor seek for danger where there's no profit i prithee to our rock you and fidele play the cooks i'll stay till hasty polydote return and bring him to dinner presently poor sick fidele i'll warily to him to gain his colour i'll let it perish of such clotten's blood and praise myself for charity exit oh thou goddess thou divine nature how thyself thou blazonest in these two princely boys they are as gentle as zephyrs blowing below the violet not wagging his sweet head yet its roof their royal blood enchafed as a rudest wind that by the top doth take the mountain pine and make him stoop to the vale tis wonder that an invisible instinct should frame them to royalty unlearned honour untaught civility not seen from other valour that wildly grows in them but yields a crop as if it had been sowed yet still it's strange what cloten being here to us portends or what his death will bring us re-enter Gidarius. where's my brother i have sent cloten's clot-pole down the stream in embassy to his mother his body's hostage for his return solemn music by ingenious instrument hark polydore it sounds but what occasion hath cadwell now to give it motion hark is he at home he went hence even now what does he mean since death of my dearest mother it did not speak before all solemn things should answer solemn accidents the matter triumphs for nothing and lamenting toys is jollity for apes and grief for boys is cadwall mad look here he comes re-enter Averigus with Imogen as dead, bearing her in his arms. And brings the dire occasion in his arms of what we blame him for. The bard is dead, that we have made so much on. I had rather have skipped from sixteen years of age to sixty, to have turned my living time into a crutch, than have seen this. Oh, sweetest, fairest lily, my brother wears thee, not the one half so well as when thou grewest thyself oh melancholy whoever yet could soon thy bottom find thee ooze to show what coast thy sluggish crayer might easiliest harbour in though blessed thing jove knows what man thou mightst have made but i though diest a most rare boy of melancholy how found you him stark as you see thus smiling as some fly he tickles slumber not as that star being laughed at 
his right cheek reposing on a cushion. Where? On the floor. His arms does lead. I thought he slept. I put my clouded bruises from off my feet, whose rudeness answered my steps too loud. Why, he but sleeps. If he be gone, he'll make his grave a bed. With female fairies will his tomb be haunted, and worms will not come to thee. With fairest flowers, whilst summer lasts, and I live here fidelly, I will sweeten thy sad grave. Thou shalt not lack the flower, that's like thy face, pale primrose, nor the azured harebell, like thy veins, no, nor the leaf of eglantine, whom not the slender, outsweetened, not thy breath, the radic oud, for charitable bill. O oh, Bill Shore Sammy, those rich left heirs that let their fathers lie, without a monument, bring thee all these. Ye are and for the most besides, when flowers are not, to winter ground thy cores. Prithee, have done, and do not play in wench-like words with that which is so serious. Let us bury him and not protract with admiration what is now due debt to the grave. Say, where shall's lay? By good Euryphile, our mother. Be it so, and let us spoil it all, till now our voices have got the mannish crack, sing him to the ground. As once our mother, he was like note and words, saying that Euryphile must be fidelly. Cadwall, I cannot sing. I'll weep and word it with thee, for notes of sorrow out of tune are worse than priests and veins that lie. We will speak it then. Great grief, says he, maids in the lace, for Cloten is quite forgot. He was a queen's son, boys, and though he came our enemy, remember he was paid for that. Though mean and mighty, Rotting together might have won dust, yet reverence that angel of the world doth make distinction of place between high and low. Our foe was princely, and though you took his life, as being our foe, yet bury him as a prince. Pray you, fetch him hither. Their sightes body is as good as Ajax's, when neither are alive. If you will go fetch him, we'll say our song the whilst, brother. Again. Exit Barius. Nay, Cadwall, we must lay his head to the east. My father hath a reason for it. It is true. Come on, then, and remove him. So begin. Song. Fear no more the heat of the sun, nor the furious winter's rages. Thou thy worldly task hast done. Home art gone, and tain thy wages. Golden lads and girls all must, as chimney-sweepers, come to dust. Fear no more the frown of the great, thou art past the tyrant stroke. Care no more to clothe and eat, to thee the reed is as the oak. The sceptre, learning fatic must, all follow this, and come to dust. Fear no more the lightning flash, Nor the all-dreaded thunderstone. Fear not, slander, censure rash. Thou hast finished the joy and moan. With Arviragus. All lovers young, all lovers must consign to thee, And come to dust. No exorciser harm thee. No, no witchcraft charm thee. Ghost unlaid. Forbear thee. Nothing ill come near thee. With Averigus. Quiet consummation have, and renowned be thy grave. We enter Belarius with the body of Colton. We have done our obsequies. Come, lay him down. Here's a few flowers, but boot midnight more. 
The herbs that have on them cold dew of the night are strewings fit for grapes. Upon their faces you are as flowers, now withered. Even so this herblet shell which we upon you strew. Come on, away, apart upon our knees. The groan that gave them first has them again. The pleasures here are past, so is their pain. Exeunt Belarius, Gidarius, and Arvirigus. Imogen, Awakening. Yes, sir, to Milford Haven. Which is the way? Mm, I thank you. By yond bush. Pray, how far thither? Oh, odds pitikins, can it be six mile yet? I have gone all night. Faith, I'll lie down and sleep. Mm, but soft, no bedfellow. Oh, <gasps> gods and goddesses! Seeing the body of Cloten. These flowers are like the pleasures of the world. This bloody man, the care on I hope, I dream. For so I thought I was a cave-keeper and cook to honest creatures. But tis not so. Twas but a bolt of nothing, shot at nothing, which the brain makes of fumes. Our very eyes are sometimes like our judgments, blind. Oh, good faith, I tremble stiff with fear. But if there be yet left in heaven as small a drop of pity as a wren's eye, <gasps> feared God's a part of it. Oh, the dream's here still. Even when I wake it is without me as within me, not imagined, felt. A headless man, the garments of posthumous. I know the shape of sleg. This is his hand, his foot mercurial, his martial thigh, the bronze of Hercules. But his jovial face, murder in heaven. How? Tis gone. Oh, Pisanio! All oh, curses madded Hecuba gave the Greeks, and mine to boot be darted on thee. Thou, conspired with that irregulous devil, Cloten hast here cut off, my lord. To write and read be henceforth treacherous. Damned Pisanio hath with his forged letters Damned Pisanio, from this most bravest vessel of the world struck the main top. O oh, posthumous, alas, where is thy head? Where's that? Ay, me, where's that? Pisanio might have killed thee at the heart and left his head on. How should this be? Pisanio! Tis he and Cloten, Malice and Lucre in them have laid this woe here. Oh, tis pregnant, pregnant! The drug he gave me which he said was precious and cordial to me, have I not found it murderous to the senses? That confirms it home. This is Pisanio's deed and Cloten's. Oh, give colour to my pale cheek with thy blood, that we the hoarder may seem to those which chance to find us. Go. Oh. My lord, my lord! Falls on the body. Enter Lucius, a captain, and other officers, and a soothsayer. To them the legions garrisoned in Gallia, after your will, have crossed the sea, attending you here at Milford Haven with your ships. They are in readiness. But what from Rome? The Senate hath stirred up the confiners and gentlemen of Italy, most willing spirits, that promise noble service, and they come under the conduct of bold Iachimo, Siena's brother. When expect you them? With the next benefit of the wind. This forwardness makes our hopes fair. Command our present numbers be mustered. Bid the captains look to it. Now, sir. What have you dreamed of late of this war's purpose? Last night the very gods showed me a vision. I fast and pray for their intelligence. Thus, I saw Jove's bird, the Roman eagle, winged from the spongy south to this part of the west. There vanished in the sunbeams, which portends, unless my sins abuse my divination, success to the Roman host. 
Dream often so, and never false. Soft, ho! What trunk is here without his top? The ruin speaks that sometime it was a worthy building. How? A page! Or dead, or sleeping on him? But dead, rather. For nature doth abhor to make his bed with the defunct, or sleep upon the dead. Let's see the boy's face. He's alive, my lord. He'll then instruct us of this body. Young one, inform us of thy fortunes, for it seems they crave to be demanded. Who is this that makest thy bloody pillow? Or who was he that, otherwise than noble nature did, hath altered that good picture? What's thy interest in this sad wreck? How came it? Who is it? What art thou? I am nothing. Or if not, nothing to be were better. This was my master, a very valiant Briton, and a good, that here by mountaineers lie slain. Alas, there is no more such masters. I may wander from east to occident, cry out for service, try many, all good, serve truly, never find such another master. Lack, good youth! Thou movest no less with thy complaining than thy master in bleeding. Say his name, good friend. Richard Duchamp. Aside. If I do lie and do no harm by it, though the gods hear, I hope they'll pardon it. Say you, sir. Thy name? Fidele, sir. Thou dost approve thyself the very same. Thy name well fits thy faith, thy faith thy name. Wilt take thy chance with me? I will not say thou shalt be so well mastered, but be sure, no less beloved. The Roman emperor's letters, sent by a consul to me, should not sooner than thine own worth prefer thee. Go with me. I'll follow, sir. But first, and please the gods, I'll hide my master from the flies, as deep as these poor pickaxes can dig. And when with wild wood-leaves and weeds I strewed his grave, and on it said a century of prayers, such as I can twice o'er, I'll weep and sigh, and leaving so his service, follow you, so please you entertain me. I, good youth, and rather father thee than master thee. My friends, the boy hath taught us manly duties. Let us find out the prettiest daisied plot we can, and make him with our pikes and partisans a grave. Come, arm him. Boy, he is preferred by thee to us, and he shall be interred as soldiers can. Be cheerful, wipe thine eyes. Some false are means the happier to arise. Exeunt. Scene three. A room in Cymbeline's palace. Enter Cymbeline, lords, Pisanio, and attendants. Again, and bring me word how tis with her. Exit an attendant. A fever with the absence of her son, a madness of which her life's in danger. Heavens, how deeply you at once do touch me. Imogen, the great part of my comfort, gone. My queen upon a desperate bed, and in a time when fearful wars point at me. Her son gone, so needful for this present. It strikes me past the hope of comfort. But for thee, fellow, who needs must know of her departure, and dost seem so ignorant, we'll enforce it from thee by a sharp torture. Sir, my life is yours. I humbly set it at your will. But for my mistress, I nothing know where she remains, why gone, nor when she proposes return. Beseech your highness, hold me your loyal servant. Good, my liege, the day that she was missing he was here. I dare be bond he's true and shall perform all parts of his subjection loyally. For Cloten, there wants no diligence in seeking him, and will, no doubt, be found. The time is troublesome. To Pisanio. We'll slip you for a season, but our jealousy does yet depend. So please, your majesty, the Roman legions, all from Gallia drawn, are landed on your coast, with a supply of Roman gentlemen, by the senate sent. Now for the counsel of my son and queen, I am amazed with matter. Good, my liege, 
your preparation can affront no less than what you hear of come more for more you're ready the want is but to put those powers in motion that long to move i thank you let's withdraw and meet the time as it seeks us we fear not what can from italy annoy us but we grieve at chances here away exeunt all but pisanio i heard no letter from my master since i wrote him imogen was slain tis strange nor hear i from my mistress who did promise to yield me often tidings neither know i what is betid to cloten but remain perplexed in all the heaven still must work wherein i am false i am honest not true to be true these present wars shall find i love my country even to the note of the king or i'll fall in them all other doubts by time let them be cleared fortune brings in some boats that are not steered exit scene four wales before the cave of belarius enter belarius Gidarius and arbarius the noise is round about us let us from it what pleasure sir find we in life to lock it from action and adventure nay what hope have we in hiding us this way the romans must or for britain slay us or receive us for barbarous and unnatural revolts during their use and slay us after sons we'll hide to the mountains there secure us to the king's party there is no going newness of cloten's death we being not known nor mustered among the bands may drive us to a render where we have lived and so extort from us that which we have done whose answer would be death drawn on with torture this is sir a doubt in such a time nothing becoming you nor satisfying us it is not likely that when they hear the roman horses nigh behold their quartered fires have both their eyes and airs so cloyed importantly as now that they will waste their time upon our note to know from whence we are oh i am known of many in the army many years though cloten then be young you see not war him from my remembrance and besides the king hath not deserved my service nor your loves who find in my exile the want of breeding the certainty of this hard life i hopeless to have the courtesy your cradle promised but to be still hot summer's tamings and the shrinking slaves of winter then be so better to cease to be pray sir to the army i and my brother are not known yourself so out of thought and thereto so o'ergrown cannot be questioned by the sun that shines i'll deter what thing is it that i never did see man die scarce ever looked on blood but that of coward hares hot goats and vanism never best treat a horse save one that had a rider like myself who never wore roller nor iron on his heel i am ashamed to look upon the holy sun to have the benefit of his blessed beams remaining so long a poor unknown by heavens i'll go if you will bless me sir and give me leave i'll take the I, I'll better care but if you will not the hazard therefore do fall on me by the hands of romans so say i amen no reason i since of your lives you set so slight a valuation should reserve my cracked one to more care have with you boys if in your country wars you chance to die that is my bed too lads and there i'll lie lead lead aside the time seems long their blood thinks scorn till it fly out and show them princes born exeunt end of act four act five of cymbeline by william shakespeare this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Cymbeline by William Shakespeare Act V. Scene I. Britain, the Roman Camp. 
Enter Posthumus with a bloody handkerchief. Yea, bloody cloth, I'll keep thee, for I wished thou shouldst be coloured thus. You married ones, if each of you should take this course, how many must murder wives much better than themselves for rying but a little? O oh, Pisanio, every good servant does not all commands, no bond but to do just ones. Gods, if you should obtain vengeance on my faults, I ne'er had lived to put on this. So had you saved the noble Imogen to repent, and struck me, wretch, more worth your vengeance. But alack, you snatch some hence for little faults. That's love, to have them fall no more. You some permit to second ills with ills, each elder worse, and make them dread it to the doer's thrift. But Imogen is your own. Do your best wills, and make me blessed to obey. I am brought hither among the Italian gentry, and to fight against my lady's kingdom. Tis enough that Britain I have killed thy mistress. Peace, I'll give no wound to thee. Therefore, good heavens, hear patiently my purpose. I'll disrobe me of these Italian weeds, and suit myself as does a Briton peasant. So I'll fight against the part I come with. So I'll die for thee, O Imogen, even for whom my life is every breath a death. And thus, unknown, pitied nor hated, to the face of peril myself I'll dedicate. Let me make men know more valour in me than my habits show. Gods, put the strength of the Leonati in me. To shame the guise of the world I will begin, the fashion less without and more within. Exit. Scene two. Field of battle between the British and Roman camps. Enter from one side Lucius, Iachimo, and the Roman army. From the other side the British army. Posthumus Leonatus following like a poor soldier. They march over and go out. Then enter again in skirmish. Iachimo and Posthumus Leonatus. He vanquisheth and disarmeth Iachimo and then leaves him. The heaviness and guilt within my bosom takes off my manhood. I have belied a lady, the princess of this country, and the heir aunt revengingly enfeebles me. Or oh, could this carl, a very drudge of natures, have subdued me in my profession? Knighthoods and honours, born as I wear mine, are titles but of scorn. If that thy gentry Britain go before this lout as he exceeds our lords, the odds is that we scarce are men, and you are gods. Exit. The battle continues. The Britons fly. Cymbeline is taken. Then enter to his rescue Valerius, Gidarius, and Arviragus. Stand, stand. We have the advantage of the ground. The lane is guarded. Nothing roots us but the villainy of our fears. Gidarius with Arviragus. Stand. Stand and fight. Re-enter Posthumus Leonatus and seconds the Britons. They rescue Cymbeline and Exeunt. Then re-enter Lucius and Iachimo with Imogen. Away, boy, from the troops, and save thyself. For friends kill friends, and the disorders such as war were hoodwinked. Tis their fresh supplies. It is a day turned strangely, or betimes let's reinforce or fly. Exeunt. Scene three, another part of the field. Enter Posthumus, Leonatus, and a British lord. Camest thou from where they made the stand? I did, though you, it seems, come from the flyers. I did. No blame be to you, sir, for all was lost but that the heavens fought, the king himself of his wings destitute, the army broken, and but the backs of Britain seen all flying through a straight lane. The enemy, full-hearted, lolling the tongue with slaughtering, having work more plentiful than tools to do't, struck down some mortally, some slightly touched, some falling merely through fear that the straight pass was damned with dead men hurt behind, and cowards living to die with lengthened shame. Where was this lane? Close by the battle, ditched and walled with turf, which gave advantage to an ancient soldier, an honest one, I warrant, who deserved so long a breeding as his white beard came to in doing this force country. 
athwart the lane he with two striplings lads more like to run the country base than to commit such slaughter with faces fit for masks or rather fairer than those for preservation cased or shame made good the passage cried to those that fled our britain's hearts die flying not our men to darkness fleet souls that fly backwards stand or we are romans and will give you that like beasts which you shun beastly and may save but to look back and frown stand stand these three three thousand confident in act as many for three performers are the file when all the rest do nothing with this word stand stand accommodated by the place more charming with their own nobleness which could have turned a distaff to a lance gilded pale looks part shame part spirit renewed that some turned coward but by example oh a sin in war damned in the first beginners gan to look the way that they did and to grin like lions upon the pikes of the hunters then began a stop the chaser a retire anon a rout confusion thick Forthwith they fly, chickens the way which they stooped eagles, slaves the strides they victors made, and now our cowards, like fragments in hard voyages, became the life of the need, having found the back door open of the unguarded hearts. Heavens, how they wound! Some slain before, some dying, some their friends o'erborne in the former wave, ten chased by one, are now each one the slaughter-man of twenty, those that would die or e'er resist are grown the mortal bugs of the field. This was strange chance. A narrow lane, an old man, and two boys? Nay, do not wonder at it. You are made rather to wonder at the things you hear than to work any. Will you rhyme a punt and vent it for a mockery? Here is one. Two boys, an old man, twice a boy, a lane. Preserved the Britons was the Romans' bane. Nay, be not angry, sir. Lack, to what end? Who dares not stand his foe, I'll be his friend. For if he'll do as he is made to do, I know he'll quickly fly my friendship too. You have put me into rhyme. Farewell, you're angry. Still going? Exit, Lord. This is a lord. O oh, noble misery, to be of the field and ask what news of me! To-day how many would have given their honours to have saved their carcasses, took heel to do it, and yet died too. I and mine own woe, charmed, could not find death where I did hear him groan, nor feel him where he struck. Being an ugly monster, tis strange he hides him in fresh cups, soft beds, sweet words, or hath more ministers than we that draw his knives in the war. Well, I will find him, for being now a favourer to the Briton, no more a Briton. I have resumed again the part I came in. Fight I will no more, but yield me to the veriest hind that shall once touch my shoulder. Great the slaughter is here made by the Roman. Great the answer be Britons must take. For me, my ransom's death. On either side I come to spend my breath, which neither here I'll keep nor bear again, but end it by some means for Imogen. Enter two British captains and soldiers. Great Jupiter be praised! Lucius is taken. Tis thought the old man and his son were angels. There was a fourth man, in a silly habit, that gave the affront with them. So tis reported, but none of them can be found. Stand, who's there? A Roman, who had not now been drooping here if seconds had answered him. Lay hands on him, a dog. A leg of Rome shall not return to tell what crows have pecked them here. He brags his service as if he were of note. Bring him to the king. Enter Cymbeline, Bellarus, Guiderius, Arbiragus, Pisanio, soldiers, attendants, and Roman captives. The captains present posthumous Leonatus to Cymbeline, who delivers him over to a jailer, then exuant omnes. Scene 4. A British Prison. Enter posthumous Leonatus and two jailers. You shall not now be stolen, you have locks upon you. So, graze as you find pasture. Ay, or a stomach. Exit, jailers. Most welcome, bondage, for thou art away, I think, to liberty. 
Yet am I better than one that's sick of the gout, since he had rather grown so in perpetuity than be cured by the sure physician death, who is the key to unbar these locks. My conscience, thou art fettered more than my shanks and wrists. You good gods, give me the penitent instrument to pick that bolt. Then, free for ever. Is't enough? I am sorry. So children, temporal fathers, do appease. Gods are more full of mercy. Must I repent? I cannot do it better than in jives. Desired more than constrained. To satisfy, if of my freedom does the main part, take no stricter render of me than my all. I know you are more clement than vile men who of their broken debtors take a third, a sixth, a tenth, letting them thrive again on their abatement. That's not my desire. For Imogen's dear life take mine, and though tis not so dear, yet tis a life. You coined it. Tween man and man they weigh not every stamp. Though light, take pieces for the figure's sake. You rather mine being yours. And so, great powers, if you will take this audit, take this life, and cancel these cold bonds. O oh, Imogen! I'll speak to thee in silence. Sleeps. Solemn music. Enter as an apparition, Cecilius Leonatus, father to Posthumus Leonatus, an old man, attired like a warrior, leading in his hand an ancient matron, his wife, and mother to Posthumus Leonatus, with music before them. Then, after other music, follow the two Leonati, brothers to Posthumus Leonatus with wounds as they died in the wars. They circle Posthumus Leonatus round, as he lies sleeping. No more, thou thunder-master, show thy spite on mortal flies. With Mars fall out, with Juno chide, that thy adulteries, rates, and revenges. Hath my poor boy done aught but well, whose face I never saw? I died whilst in the womb he stayed, attending nature's law whose father then, as men report thou orphan's father art, thou shouldest have been, and shielded him from this earth-vexing smart. Lucina lent not me her aid, but took me in my throes, that from me was posthumous ripped, came crying amongst his foes, a thing of pity. Great nature, like his ancestry, molded the stuff so fair, that he deserved the praise o' the world, as great Cecilius's heir. Where once he was mature for man, in Britain where was he that could stand up his parallel, or fruitful object be in eye of Imogen that best could deem his dignity? With marriage wherefore was he mocked to be exiled, and thrown from Leonati's seat, and cast from her his dearest one sweet Imogen? Why did you suffer Iachimo, slight thing of Italy? to taint his nobler heart and brain with needless jealousy, and to become the geck in scorn o' the other's villainy. For this from stiller seats we came, our parents and us twain, that striking in our country's cause fell bravely and were slain, our fealty and tenacious right with honour to maintain. Like hardiment posthumous hath to Cymbeline performed. Then Jupiter, thou king of gods, why hast thou thus adjourned the graces for his merits due, being all to dolors turned? Thy crystal window ope, look out, no longer exercise upon a valiant race thy harsh and potent injuries. Since, Jupiter, our son is good, take off his miseries. Peep through thy marble mansion, help or we poor ghosts will cry to the shining synod of the rest against thy deity. With first brother. Help, Help Jupiter, Jupiter, or we, we appeal, appeal, and, and from, from thy justice fly. Jupiter descends in thunder and lightning. Sitting upon an eagle, he throws a thunderbolt. The apparitions fall on their knees. No, no more, you, you petty, petty spirits, spirits of the region, region low, low offend, offend our, our hearing. hearing. Hush! Hush. Hush. How, How dare, dare you, ghosts, ghosts accuse the thunderer, thunderer whose bolt you know sky-planted batters all rebelling coasts? Poor shadows of Elysium, hence, and, and, and rest, rest upon, upon your never-withering banks, banks of flowers. 
Be not with mortal accidents suppressed. No care of yours it is, you know tis ours. Whom best I love, I cross. To make my gift the more delayed, delighted. Be content. Your low-laid son our Godhead will uplift. His comforts thrive, his trials well are spent. Our jovial star reigned at his birth, and in our temple was he married. Rise and fade. He shall be Lord of Lady Imogen, and happier much by his affliction made. This tablet lay on his breast, wherein our pleasure his full fortune doth confine, and so away. No further with your din express impatience, lest you stir up mine. Mount, eagle, to my palace crystalline. Ascends. He came in thunder. His celestial breath was sulphurous to smell. The holy eagle stooped as to foot us. His ascension is more sweet than our blessed fields. His royal bird prunes the immortal wing and cloys his beak, as when his god is pleased. Thanks, Thanks Jupiter. The marble pavement closes. He has entered his radiant root. Away! And, to be blessed, let us with care perform his great behest. The apparitions vanish. Waking. Sleep. Thou hast been a grandsire, and begot a father to me. And thou hast created a mother and two brothers. But, O oh, scorn! Gone! They went hence so soon as they were born. And so I am awake. Poor wretches that depend on greatness' favour, dream as I have done, wake and find nothing. But alas, I swerve, many dream not to find, neither deserve, and yet are steeped in favours. So am I, that have this golden chance, and know not why. What fairies haunt this crown? A book, O oh, rare one! Be not, as is our fangled world, a garment nobler than that it covers. Let thy effects so follow to be most unlike our courtiers, as good as promise. Reads. When as a lion's whelp shall to himself unknown, without seeking find, and be embraced by a piece of tender air, and when from a stately cedar shall be lopped branches, which being dead many years shall after revive, be jointed to the old stock and freshly grow, then shall Posthumus end his miseries, Britain be fortunate, and flourish in peace and plenty. Tis still a dream, or else such stuff as madmen tongue and brain not, either both or nothing, or senseless speaking, or a speaking such as sense cannot untie. Be what it is, the action of my life is like it, which I'll keep, if but for sympathy. Re-enter first jailer. Come, sir, are you ready for death? Over-roasted, rather, ready long ago. Hanging is the word, sir. If you are ready for that, you are well cooked. So if I prove a good repast to the spectators, the dish pays the shot. A heavy reckoning for you, sir, but the comfort is you shall be called to no more payments. Fear no more tavern bills, which are often the sadness of parting, as the procuring of mirth. You come in flint for want of meat, depart reeling with too much drink. Sorry that you have paid too much and sorry that you are paid too much. Purse and brain both empty, the brain the heavier for being too light, the purse too light, being drawn of heaviness. Of this contradiction you shall now be quit. Oh, the charity of a penny cord! It sums up thousands in a trice. You have no true debitor and creditor but it. Of what's past is, and to come the discharge. Your neck, sir, is pen, book, and counters. So 
The acquittance follows. I am merrier to die than thou art to live. Indeed, sir. He that sleeps feels not the toothache. But a man that were to sleep your sleep, and a hangman to help him to bed, I think he would change places with his officer. For, look you, sir, you know not which way you shall go. Yes, indeed do I, fellow. Your death has eyes in his head, then. I have not seen him so pictured. You must either be directed by some that take upon them to know, or do take upon yourself that which I am sure you do not know, or jump the after inquiry on your own peril. And how you shall speed in your journey's end, I think you'll never return to tell one. I tell thee, fellow, there are none want eyes to direct them the way I am going, but such as wink and will not use them. What an infinite mock is this, that a man should have the best use of eyes to see the way of blindness. I'm sure hanging's the way of winking. Enter a messenger. Knock off his manacles. Bring your prisoner to the king. Thou bringst good news. I am called to be made free. I'll be hanged, then. Thou shalt be, then, freer than a jailer. No bolts for the dead. Exit Posthumus Leonatus and Messenger. Unless a man would marry a gallows and beget young gibbets, I never saw one so prone. Yet, on my conscience, there are verier knaves desire to live, for all he be a Roman, and there be some of them, too, that die against their wills. So should I, if I were one. I would we were all of one mind, and one mind good. Oh, there were desolation of jailers and gallowses. I speak against my present prophet, but my wish hath a preferment in it. Exeunt. Scene five. Cymbeline's tent. Enter Cymbeline, Belarius, Gidarius, Arviragus, Pisanio, lords, officers, and attendants. Stand by my side, you whom the gods have made preservers of my throne. Woe is my heart that the poor soldier that so richly fought, whose rags shamed gilded arms, whose naked breast stepped before the targes of proof, cannot be found. He shall be happy that can find him, if our grace can make him so. I never saw such noble fury and so poor a thing, such precious deeds in one that promises naught but beggary and poor looks. No tidings of him. He hath been searched among the dead and living, but no trace of him. To my grief I am the heir of his reward. To Belarius, Gedarius, and Averagus. Which I will add to you, the liver, heart, and brain of Britain, by whom I grant she lives. Tis now the time to ask of whence you are. Report it. Sir, in Cumbria are we born, and gentlemen. Further to boast, were neither true nor modest, unless I add, we are honest. Bow your knees. Arise, my knights of the battle. I create you companions to our person, and will fit you with dignities becoming your estates. Enter Cornelius and ladies. There's business in these faces. Why so sadly greet you our victory? You look like Romans, and not of the court of Britain. Hail, great king. To sour your happiness, I must report, the queen is dead. Who, worse than a physician, would this report become? But I consider, by medicine life may be prolonged, yet death will seize the doctor too. How ended she? With horror, madly dying, like her life which, being cruel to the world, concluded most cruel to herself. What she confessed I will report, so please you. These her women can trip me, if I err, who with wet cheeks were present when she finished. Prithee, say. First she confessed she never loved you, 
only affected greatness got by you, not you. Married your royalty, was wife to your place, abhorred your person. She alone knew this, and, but she spoke it dying, I would not believe her lips in opening it. Proceed. Your daughter, whom she bore in hand to love with such integrity, she did confess was as a scorpion to her sight, whose life but that her flight prevented it. She had ta'en off by poison. Oh, most delicate fiend! Who is it can read a woman? Is there more? More, sir, and worse. She did confess she had for you a mortal mineral, which being took, should by the minute feed on life, and lingering by inches waste you, in which time she purposed by watching, weeping, tendance, kissing, to o'ercome you with her show, and in time, when she had fitted you with her craft, to work her son into the adoption of the crown. But failing of her end, by his strange absence, grew shameless, desperate, opened in despite of heaven and man her purposes, repented the evils she hatched were not affected, so despairing died. Heard you all this, her women? We did, so please your highness. Mine eyes were not in fault, for she was beautiful. Mine ears that heard her flattery, nor my heart that thought her like her seeming. It had been vicious to have mistrusted her. Yet, oh, my daughter, that it was folly in me thou mayest say, and prove it in thy feeling. Heaven mend all. Enter Lucius, Iachimo, the soothsayer, and other Roman prisoners, guarded. Posthumus Leonatus behind, and Imogen. Thou comest not, Caius, now for tribute, that the Britons have raised out, though with the loss of many a bold one, whose kinsmen have made suit that their good souls may be appeased with slaughter of you their captives, which ourself have granted. So think of your estate. Consider, sir, the chance of war. The day was yours by accident. Had it gone with us, we should not, when the blood was cool, have threatened our prisoners with the sword. But since the gods will have it thus, that nothing but our lives may be called ransom, let it come, sufficeth a Roman with a Roman's heart can suffer. Augustus lives to think on it, and so much for my peculiar care. This one thing only I will entreat. My boy, a Briton born, let him be ransomed. Never master had a page so kind, so duteous, diligent, so tender over his occasions, true, so feet, so nurse-like. Let his virtue join with my request, which I make bold your highness cannot deny. He hath done no Briton harm, though he hath served a Roman. Save him, sir, and spare no blood beside. I have surely seen him. His favour is familiar to me. Boy, thou hast looked thyself into my grace, and art mine own. I know not why, wherefore, to say live, boy. Ne'er thank thy master. Live, and ask of Cymbeline what boon thou wilt, fitting my bounty and thy state. I'll give it. Yea, though thou do demand a prisoner, the noblest ta'en. I humbly thank your highness. I do not bid thee beg my life, good lad, and yet I know thou wilt. No, no, alack, there's other work in hand. I see a thing bitter to me as death. Your life, good master, must shuffle for itself. The boy disdains me. He leaves me, scorns me. Briefly die their joys that place them on the truth of girls and boys. Why stands he so perplexed? What wouldst thou, boy? I love thee more and more. Think more and more what's best to ask. Knowest him thou look'st on? Speak, wilt have him live? Is he thy kin, thy friend? He is a Roman, no more kin to me than I to your highness, who being born your vassal am something nearer. Wherefore eyest him so? I'll tell you, sir, in private, if you please to give me hearing. Ay, with all my heart, and lend my best attention. What's thy name? Fideli, sir. 
thou art my good youth my page i'll be thy master walk with me speak freely cymbeline and imogen converse apart is not this boy revived from death once and another not more resembles that sweet rosy lad who died and was fidelly what think you the same dead thing alive peace peace see further he eyes us not for bear creatures may be alike were he i am sure he would have spoke to us but we saw him dead be silent let's see further aside it is my mistress since she is living let the time run on to good or bad cymbeline and imogen come forward come stand thou by our side make thy demand aloud to yakimo sir step you forth give answer to this boy and do it freely or by our greatness and the grace of it which is our honour bitter torture shall winnow the truth from falsehood on speak to him my boon is that this gentleman may render of whom he had this ring aside what's that to him that diamond upon your finger say how came it yours thou'lt torture me to leave unspoken that which to be spoke would torture thee how me i am glad to be constrained to utter that which torments me to conceal by villainy i got this ring twas leonatus jewel whom thou didst banish and which more may grieve thee as it doth me a nobler sir ne'er lived twixt sky and ground wilt thou hear me more my lord all that belongs to this that paragon thy daughter for whom my heart drops blood and my false spirits quail to remember give me leave i faint my daughter what of her renew thy strength i had rather thou shouldst live while nature will than die ere i hear more strive man and speak upon a time unhappy was the clock that struck the hour it was in rome accursed the mansion where twas at a feast oh, oh would our viands have been poisoned or at least those which i heaved to head the good posthumous what should i say i was too good to be where ill men were and was the best of all amongst the rarest of good ones sitting sadly hearing us praise our loves of italy for beauty that made barren the swelled boast of him that best could speak for feature laming the shrine of venus or straight pint minerva postures beyond brief nature for condition a shop of all the qualities that man loves woman for besides that hook of wiving fairness which strikes the eye i stand on fire come to the matter all too soon i shall unless thou wouldst grieve quickly this posthumous most like a noble lord in love and one that had a royal lover took his hint and not dispraising who we praised therein he was as calm as virtue he began his mistress picture which by his tongue being made and then a mind put in either our brags were cracked of kitchen trolls or his description proved us unspeaking sots nay nay to the purpose your daughter's chastity there it begins he spake of her as dian had hot dreams and she alone were cold whereat i wretch made scruple of his praise and wagered with him pieces of gold against this which then he wore upon his honoured finger to attain in suit the place of bed and wing this ring by hers and mine adultery he true knight no lesser of her honour confident that i did truly find her stakes this ring and would so had it been a carbuncle of phoebus wheel and might so safely had it been all the worth of scar away to britain post i in this design well may you sir remember me at court where i was taught of your chaste daughter the wide difference twixt amorous and villainous being thus quenched of hope not longing mine italian brain gan in your duller britain operate most vilely for my vantage 
excellent and to be brief my practice so prevailed that i returned with similar proof enough to make the noble leonatus mad by wounding his belief in her renown with tokens thus and thus averting notes of chamber hanging pictures this her bracelet oh cunning how i got it nay some marks of secret on her person that he could not but think her bond of chastity quite cracked i having taken the forfeit whereupon methinks i see him now posthumus leonatus advancing ay so thou dost italian fiend ay me most credulous fool egregious murderer thief anything that's due to all the villains past in being to come oh give me cord or knife or poison some upright justicer thou king send out for torturers ingenious it is i that all the abhorred things of the earth amend by being worse than they i am posthumus that killed thy daughter villain-like i lie that caused a lesser villain than myself a sacrilegious thief to do't the temple of virtue was she yea and she herself spit and throw stones cast mire upon me set the dogs of the street to bay me every villain be called posthumus leonatus and be villainy less than twas oh imogen my queen my life my wife oh imogen 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 peace my lord hear hear shalls have a play of this thou scornful page there lie thy part striking her she falls oh gentlemen help mine and your mistress oh my lord posthumus you ne'er killed Imogen till now. Help, help, mine honoured lady. Does the world go round? How come these staggers on me? Wake, my mistress. If this be so, the gods do mean to strike me to death with mortal joy. How fares thy mistress? Oh, get thee from my sight! Thou gavest me poison! Dangerous fellow, hence! Breathe not where princes are! The tune of Imogen. Lady, the gods throw stones of sulphur on me, if that box I gave you was not thought by me a precious thing. I had it from the queen. New matter still. It poisoned me. O oh gods, I left out one thing which the queen confessed, which must approve thee honest. If Pisanio have, said she, given his mistress that confection which I gave him for cordial, she has served as I would serve a rat. What's this, Cornelius? The queen, sir, very often pertuned me to temper poisons for her, still pretending the satisfaction of her knowledge, only in killing creatures vile, as cats and dogs, of no esteem. I, dreading that her purpose was of more danger, did compound for her a certain stuff, which, being tain, would cease the present power of life, but in short time all offices of nature should again do their due functions. Have you tain of it? Most like I did, for I was dead. My boys, there was our error. This is, sure, for daily. Why did you throw your wedded lady from you? Think that you are upon a rock, and now throw me again. Embracing him. Hang there like a fruit, my soul, till the tree die. How now, my flesh, my child? What, makest thou me a dullard in this act? Wilt thou not speak to me? Kneeling. Your blessing, sir. To Guiderius and Averagus. Though you did love this youth, I blame ye not. You had a motive for it. My tears that fall prove holy water on thee. Imogen, thy mother's dead. I am sorry for it, my lord. Oh, she was not and long of her it was that we meet here so strangely but her son is gone we know not how nor where my lord now fear is from me i'll speak troth lord cloten 
upon my lady's missing, came to me with his sword drawn, foamed at the mouth, and swore, if I discovered not which way she was gone, it was my instant death. By accident, had a faint letter of my master's then in my pocket, which directed him to seek her on the mountains near to Milford, where, in a frenzy in my master's garments, which he enforced from me, away he posts with unchaste purpose, and with oath to violate my lady's honour. What became of him, I further know not. Let me end the story. I slew him there. Mary, the gods forfend! I would not thy good deeds should from my lips pluck a hard sentence. Prithee, valiant youth, deny it again. I have spoke it, and I did it. He was a prince. A most incivil one. The wrongs he did me were nothing prince-like. For he did provoke me with language that would make me spurn the sea if it could so roar to me. I cut off his head, and am right glad he is not standing here to tell this tale of mine. I am sorry for thee, by thine own tongue thou art condemned, and must endure our law. Thou art dead. That headless man I thought had been my lord. Bind the offender, and take him from our presence. Stay, Sir King. This man is better than a man he slew, as well descended as thyself, and hath more of thee merited than a band of clotons ever had scar for. To the guard. Let his arms alone. They were not born for bondage. Why, old soldier, wilt thou undo the worth thou art unpaid for by tasting of our wrath? How of descent as good as we? In that he spake too far. And thou shalt die for it. We will die all three. But I will prove that two wants are as good as I have given out him. My sons, I must, for my own part, unfold a dangerous speech, though haply well for you. Your danger is ours. And our good, his. How about it then? By leave thou hadst, great king, a subject who was called Bellarius. What of him? He is a banished traitor. He it is that hath assumed this age. Indeed, a banished man, I know not how, a traitor. Take him hence, the whole world shall not save him. Not too hot, first pay me for the nursing of thy sons, and let it be confiscate all, so soon as I have received it. Nursing of my sons? I am too blunt and saucy, here's my knee. Ere I arise, I will prefer my sons, then spare not the old father. Mighty sir, these two young gentlemen that call me father, and think they are my sons, are none of mine. They are the issue of your loins, my liege, and blood of your begetting. How? My issue? So sure as you, your fathers, I, old Morgan, am that Bellarius whom you sometime banished. Your pleasure was my mere offence, my punishment itself, and all my treason. That I suffered was all the harm I did. These gentle princes, for such and so they are, these twenty years have I trained up, those arts they have as I could put into them. My breeding was, sir, as your highness knows. Their nurse, Euryphile, whom for the theft I wedded, stole these children upon my banishment. I moved her to it, having received the punishment before, for that which I did then. Beaten for loyalty, excited me to treason. Their dear loss, the more of you t'was felt, the more it shaped unto my end of stealing them. But, gracious sir, here are your sons again, and I must lose two of the sweetest companions in the world. The benediction of these covering heavens fall on their heads like dew, for they are worthy to inlay heaven with stars. Thou weep'st and speak'st. The service that you three have done is more unlike than this thou tellest. I lost my children. If these be they, I know not how to wish a pair of worthier sons. Be pleased a while. This gentleman, whom I call Polydor, most worthy prince as yours, is true Guderius. This gentleman, my Cadwal, Aviragus, your younger princely son, he, sir, was lapped in a most curious mantle, wrought by the hand of his queen-mother, which for more probation I can with ease produce. 
Guiderius had upon his neck a mole, a sanguine star. It was a mark of wonder. This is he, who hath upon him still that natural stamp. It was wise nature's end in the donation, to be his evidence now. Oh, what, am I a mother to the birth of three? Ne'er mother rejoiced deliverance more. Blessed pray you be that after this strange starting from your orbs may reign in them now. Oh, Imogen, thou hast lost by this a kingdom. No, my lord, I have got two worlds by it. Oh, my gentle brothers, have we thus met? Oh, never say hereafter, but I am truest speaker. You called me brother when I was but your sister. I, you brothers, when ye were so indeed. Did you e'er meet? Ah, my good lord. And at first meeting, loved, continued so, until we thought he died. By the queen's dram she swallowed. Oh, rare instinct! When shall I hear all through? This fierce abridgment hath to it circumstantial branches which distinction should be rich in. Where? How lived you? And when came you to serve our Roman captive? How parted with your brothers? How first met them? Why fled you from the court, and whither? These, and your three motives to the battle, with I know not how much more, should be demanded, and all the other by dependencies from chance to chance. But nor the time nor place will serve our long interrogatories. See, posthumous anchors upon Imogen, and she, like harmless lightning, throws her eye on him, her brother, me, her master, hitting each object with a joy. The counterchange is severally in all. Let's quit this ground and smoke the temple with our sacrifices. To Belarius. Thou art my brother, so we'll hold thee ever. You are my father, too, and did relieve me to see this gracious season. All o'erjoyed, save these in bonds. Let them be joyful, too, for they shall taste our comfort. My good master, I will yet do you service. Happy be you. The forlorn soldier that so nobly fought, he would have well become this place, and graced the thankings of a king. I am, sir, the soldier that did company these three, in poor beseeming. T'was a fitment for the purpose I then followed. That I was he. Speak, Iachimo. I had you down, and might have made you finish. Kneeling. I am down again. But now my heavy conscience sinks my knees, as then your force did. Take that life, beseech you, which I so often owe, but your ring first. And here the bracelet of your truest princess that ever swore her faith. Kneel not to me. The power that I have on you is to spare you. The malice towards you to forgive you. Live and deal with others better. Nobly doomed, we'll learn our freeness of a son-in-law. Pardons the word to all. You help us, sir, as it did mean indeed to be our brother. Joyed are we that you are. Your servant, princes. Good my lord of Rome, call forth your soothsayer. As I slept, methought great Jupiter, upon his eagle-backed, appeared to me, with other sprightly shows of mine own kindred. When I waked, I found this label on my bosom, whose containing is so from sense in hardness that I can make no collection of it. Let him show his skill in the construction. Philarmonus! Hear, my good lord. Read, and declare the meaning. Reads. When, as a lion's whelp shall, to himself unknown, without seeking find, and be embraced by a piece of tender air, and when from a stately cedar shall be lopped branches, which, being dead many years, shall after revive, be joined to the old stock, and freshly grow, then shall Posthumus end his miseries, Britain be fortunate, and flourish in peace and plenty. Thou, Leonatus, art the lion's whelp. The fit and apt construction of thy name being Leonatus doth import so much. 
to Cymbeline. The piece of tender air, thy virtuous daughter, which we call Mollus air, and Mollus air we term it Mulier, which Mulier I divine, is this most constant wife, who even now, answering the letter of the oracle unknown to you, unsought, were clipped about with this most tender air. This hath some seeming. The lofty cedar, royal Cymbeline, personates thee, and thy lopped branches point thy two sons forth, who, by Bellarius stolen, for many years thought dead, are now revived to the majestic cedar joined, whose issue promises Britain peace and plenty. Well, my peace we will begin. And, Caius Lucius, although the victor, we submit to Caesar and to the Roman Empire, promising to pay our wonted tribute from the which we were dissuaded by our wicked queen, whom heavens, in justice both on her and hers, have laid most heavy hand. The fingers of the powers above do tune the harmony of this peace. The vision which I made known to Lucius, ere the stroke of this yet scarce cold battle, at this instant is full accomplished. For the Roman eagle, from south to west, on wings soaring aloft, lessened herself, and in the beams of the sun so vanished, which foreshadowed our princely eagle, the imperial Caesar, should again unite his favour with the radiant Cymbeline, which shines here in the west. Laud we the gods, and let our crooked smokes climb to their nostrils from our blessed altars. Publish we this peace to all our subjects. Set we forward. Let a Roman and a British ensign wave friendly together. So through Ludstown march, and in the temple of great Jupiter, our peace we'll ratify. Seal it with feasts. Set on there. Never was a war did cease, ere bloody hands were washed with such a peace. Exeunt. End of Act 5. End of Cymbeline by William Shakespeare.